cafes and on playgrounds for Nigerian children. I'm Vanessa Tyler with Mike Stevens on your home for 24-7 News, the Black Information Network. Take a look under your bed. Find stuff under there? What about jobs? No? Now try your basement. There's a pair of overalls that overall you're not so into anymore. A perfectly good laptop that hasn't sat in your lap in months. And even more stuff, but still no jobs? Well, you really have both. See, stuff is defined as household articles considered as a group. Sometimes this stuff is no longer needed. Wait, no longer needed? That can't be right. Because remember those jobs you were looking for? Those are really needed, and they're the stuff inside your stuff. Even inside that winter coat that moved with you to Phoenix. Our job is to unlock those jobs, and it starts when you donate your stuff to your local Goodwill. Here's how we do it. When you donate to Goodwill, we sell your stuff to provide job training for people right here in your community. So just by teaming up with Goodwill, you help create jobs. And isn't that worth parting with the leftover guitar from your 80s cover band? Goodwill. Donate stuff, create jobs. Find your nearest donation center at Goodwill.org. A message from Goodwill and the Ad Council. I'm Soma, and I'll be your server this evening. The special is Pasta Primavera, and it comes with a salad. Oh, and by the way, I abuse my children. Lots of times, I beat them for even the smallest reason. When they really get on my nerves, I lock them in the closet for a few hours. If only child abuse was this easy to recognize, perhaps then more people would report it. If you even suspect abuse, call Child Help at 1-800-4-A-CHILD or visit www.childhelp.org. We've helped millions of people help millions of children, and we can help you. All calls are anonymous and confidential. So remember, 1-800-4-A-CHILD or visit www.childhelp.org. Child Help. Trust your instincts. A public service message brought to you by Child Help and the Ad Council. Hey Alexa, play WVON 1690 AM. Getting WVON 1690 AM station from iHeartRadio. Try it out for yourself. America is listening to WVON. I'm Sally, a volunteer at United Way. I'm asking people around the neighborhood what they think this place needs. Uh, excuse me, hi. What do you think this place needs? I'd like to see more parking. More playgrounds. Free movies. Oh, uh, that's easy. Better restaurants. And you, uh, what do you think this place needs? This place? Oh, more ice cream trucks. Okay. <laughs> uh, how about you? Wi-Fi everywhere? I was thinking more money in the pockets of local families come tax time. Um, can I change my answer? I was just kidding about the ice cream. Oh, that's way better. Uh, now that you mention it. When it comes to getting better tax refunds into the hands of local families, what this place needs is you. To donate or volunteer, go to unitedway.org. Because great things happen when we live united. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. Hey Alexa, play WVON 1690 AM. Getting WVON 1690 AM station from iHeartRadio. Try it out for yourself. America is listening to WVON. The views expressed on our programs are not necessarily those of WVON, Midway Broadcasting Corporation, or our participating sponsors. From the Xfinity Studios at WVON, we are the talk of Chicago, 1690 WVON. Now you official now, but you got a soul to say. I just been cooking that note. I'm about to drop in the fuel. Think if I call it the great, the people going to call it the truth. This is Malar Rahman Rahim, brothers and sisters. You are listening to another edition of Straight Words on WVON 1690. This is the talk of Chicago. We are here with you another Tuesday night from 9 p.m. until midnight, three hours of compelling black talk, black strong, and unapologetically pro farrakhan And I've got two great brothers on the line. These brothers are icons in the publishing industry. Our brother, now by Richard Muhammad. He is the uh, editor-in-chief of the Final Call newspaper. Our other great brother, James G. Muhammad, former editor, and now a contributing editor to the Final Call newspaper. I'm Brother B.J. Murphy, 
And it's time to get it on once again. Assalamu alaikum, my big brothers. How y'all feeling tonight? Oh, alaikum salam. Doing wonderful. And Brother Nabi is the captain of this ship, brother. Hey, yes, brother. Uh, well, uh, uh, Assalamu uh, alaikum, my brothers. I hope uh, y'all are doing well. I hope my sound good, is right. good. My it's skin good. is strong. Good. Uh, yes, but, man, I tell you, brothers, I'm excited, Brother BJ, because <clears throat> when you talk about what we do and why we do, we're going to yeah. have three hours of serious talk. So, brothers and sisters, I want you to tune in carefully. I want you to call in, though. Because we're going to talk about the, some serious things involving the status of our children. So Brother Editor James is going to take us in some of the things happening right in Chicago at the Juvenile Justice Center that you need to know about, that we need to be involved in. So then we, we're going to leave from up south in Chicago, and we're going to take you down south to New Iberia. New Iberia, Louisiana, and we're going to get into the case of an 11-year-old black girl who was facing charges connected with murder, and this 11-year-old has been in prison since last fall. I'm I'm not calling it juvenile facility. I'm calling it prison because that's what it is. You can't get up and walk out, right? Somebody locking you in, you behind bars. Yeah. They got the right to beat your rump rump and all of that stuff. You're in jail. You're in prison. Yeah, sir. Right. You're in prison. Yeah. And it ain't no joke. And I want us to look at the seriousness of that. Um, and then, in addition to that, this 11-year-old girl has a 15-year-old brother who has now been charged with murder of a mm-hmm. white man in Louisiana, New Iberia. Mm-hmm. So we're going to have some great guests. Uh, We're going to have Brother uh, Laramie, who is with Evolve Louisiana, right on the ground, Uh, been doing great work. We're going to have um, National Correspondent Charlene Muhammad uh, from The Final Call, who was down there, uh, pumps on the ground today. The little girl was supposed to be sentenced, so we'll get into that. Going to have the Brother Rashad, Muhammad out of Baton Rouge, who was there. Uh, student Minister Willie Muhammad out of, out of uh, New Orleans went down to get a report for himself to submit to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Um, but the first thing we're going to do, we're going to turn it over to Brother James G. Muhammad, and he's going to lead us into this subject of yes, what's sir. happening to our babies right in the Windy City. Yes, sir. Thank you, Brother Naba. Um, sounds it's a great lineup that you got, and I want our audience to know that when we bring people on, all of the people that he mentioned, they they're coming on with the perspective of the best interest of the black community. It's not going to be no dancing, no sugar coating. It's going to be straight, no ch- no chaser with our interest in in mind. But the first right. topic we want to talk about, <clears throat> and we're expecting. Uh, a guest, a very important guest on involves children as well. Over on the uh, near west side, there's a facility called IYC, which is the Illinois Youth Center, also known as a juvenile, the Juvie Center, where juveniles who can get into trouble or, or maybe are sentenced for certain periods of time, they go there to serve out their time. But not only are they abused and uh, maybe sometimes guided into criminal activity or just choose the wrong path, They're abused in that situation, but they also, unfortunately, are oftentimes abused when they go into uh, where they're supposed to get correction and guidance so that they would come out a better human being. But instead, they they are further abused. They are further uh, misguided, and uh, we want to talk about that today. We're expecting... State Senator Lakeisha Collins to call in, so we'll bring her on once we hear that she's on. But this this last past Friday, there was a rally protest outside of the facility. One of the um, speakers were was Brother Damon Dash, who's a hip hop entrepreneur, I believe co-founder of Rockefeller, if I'm not uh, mistaken, That's Rockefeller right. Records. Uh, okay. Very uh, very uh, committed brother. He lent his voice to this issue 
came to Chicago and stood uh, with the principal of the facility, Brother uh, McGron, uh, McGron, who has a history of doing some good work in schools. He is now the principal there. And they called a press conference to talk about some of the issues uh, of impacting our young brothers and sisters at that, at that facility. Some of the things they mentioned, and they and uh, Brother Damon Dash was able to tour the facility several times, uh, and once he was with Senator Collins as they toured the facility. On the day of the protest, they were denied access to the building. But but some of the things they listed, and these are very serious things too. Bathroom showers are covered with mold. This is mold that when you have mold, you you know you get out of your house when you have mold. You move until the mold is removed. The vents throughout the facility are clogged with soot. So they're breathing soot. Um, and I, we're expecting Sister Collins, I think she just sent me a little note. She'll be, she'll be on in a few minutes. Uh, puddles of water outside the showers. That's water that is there with, with mold. So you know that's not a good situation. Mice and rodents running through the facility. They're breathing recycled air. And again, the facility is almost like a warehouse. There is no, there are very few windows. So they don't get good sunlight. And then another one of the complaints was that some of the youth have not gone outside in over a year due to the lack of green space. And so can you imagine being locked up in a facility where it's just cement and not being able to just get outside for some for some fresh air or just to see greenery, which is part of nature. You know, we need that just to feel the human. And right. lastly, uh, some of the youth have reported drinking water from the mop room, where the closets where they store the mops and, you know, all of that, and you have to drink water from out of the faucet there, and some of that mold is in those closets as well. And lastly, and I'm going to read from their press uh, release on this one, it said that youth complained on how they were abused by the chief security at IYC Chicago, two youths who transferred from IYC in Harrisburg, reported to being physically assaulted by security, one of them having his braids ripped out of his head, and the other was beaten with handcuffs that were used as brass knuckles. And mm. so, brothers and sisters, these are some of the... Uh, conditions that our young people are dealing with right here in our own city of Chicago, where they're supposed to get rehab, they're supposed to get education, they're supposed to get courses that that uh, that improve their lives and, and give them guidance so that when they come out, they have maybe some skills or definitely some guidance to, to lead a different path when they come out. But instead, uh, some of the stories that Senator Collins will recount uh, will we'll bring tears to your eyes, as the principal mentioned when he was at the uh, press conference. Uh, people who wow. toured, they come out with wow. tears in their eyes. So that's what we're expecting to hear when she gets that. But this is not only at IYC. This is across the country. Uh, as we know, there's been many, uh, uh, many incidents, instances with this. Uh, were you able yes, to sir. pull up any of the uh, commentary from yeah. the press conference? Right? Yes, sir. We got Damon Dash on, but that cut you were requesting, we got that ready to play now if you want to play it, Brother James. Yes, sir. Let's just play that. We can hear a little bit of what he was mentioning while we wait for the senator to get on. And, and the light of day, day, and that's what we have to do. That's representing making sure we good. good. And again, it ain't about the problem, it's about bringing awareness to a situation where they're torturing our kids. Modern day medieval torture. Some of these kids they seen the light of day they ain't been outside in over a year. They got these kids taking showers and drinking out of mop buckets next to molded water with mice running around. Yeah. And if they said something, they got the nerve to put a kid in the room and pull his dreads out with their hair, like with their hands. You know, and then they not educating, they're drugging them up. And they expect them not to come back? No, they want them to come back. But they shouldn't get tortured. Yeah. These kids are traumatized. And there is no therapy up there from anyone with any color. Or not even a male figure up there. So our first one up there was only white people, white women giving black kids therapy. And that seems intentional. You 
Right. So they put the bicycle cops out. I'm not mad at them. You know, they're doing their job. We're peaceful. Everyone's peaceful. What we going to do? We're going to get, we're going to bug out next to a jail. We don't want to go right there. And then when we was in there, they tried to lock us in. So, you know, I'm just bringing the wind. So I want everybody to bring the wind. That's Damon Dash, y'all, from uh, speaking at IYC last week. He was in Chicago trying to speak up for the young brothers and sisters that are incarcerated. Yeah, There's you a lot know, of brothers brother there, BJ, too. Yes, sir. You know, Brother BJ, the thing that what this says to me, if I wasn't a criminal or a real criminal when I went in, I would certainly be one when I come out. Yeah, because an angry, these, an angry one at that. Yeah, and because these experiences now, they they shape people. They shape young people, many of whom are already have been in a certain spot. So when I go to a place and I'm listening and watching the hypocrisy of folks talking about justice and obey the law, I don't see none of that. So I don't have respect. I don't grow in my respect for the law. I grow in, 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 in the reality of there is no justice. So if right. they're not just, if they're not fair, if they wilding out, if they doing whatever they want to do in here, why can't I do whatever I want to do on the street? Because I'm just trying to survive. Right. So, brothers and sisters, this, this, this here, this is a serious thing. Mm-hmm. And we are always disproportionately it's our children in these facilities for any number of reasons, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when, then, when, when you don't know and you're young, you – look, man, let me just say this. I wasn't a quote-unquote bad child or youngster. I, I, I did stuff, but I always had a limit, right? But if I would have been in the wrong place, at the right time, my life would be totally different, man. If I hadn't said, if they, man, we going out here, oh, well, me and, me and Phil just going to sit here and listen to some music. You know? I mm-hmm. will see y'all when we get back from having this business. Brothers and sisters, I ain't talking about 2020. I'm talking about 1977. Right. I'm talking about being in junior high school. Where my boy, we waiting for the bus. So, you know, some of the older guys from the high school started kind of harassing us. We get on the bus. One of the high school students kicks my boy in the back. We like in the seventh grade. He came back the next day with a little 22, man. Mm. I'm talking 77. Right. I'm talking 76, 19. We waited at that bus stop, brother, till the sun went down, till it got cold. My <laughs> last boy didn't show yeah. up. That boy didn't that show didn't, up that day. But if that he just showed up, he was going to get shot. Mm. So my point is this. None of us, I don't think, should act as though we don't understand. And if you don't understand, spend some time educating yourself. I'm talking to some of these young brothers. Go ahead, Brother Jack. Mm-hmm. Um, the other, the other parts of this is, I don't like you said they're prisoners. One of the uh, things yeah. the principal was very concerned about. A lot of these young boys are given drugs, medic mm. prescript, prescribed medication at that at some points. You know, sedatives, et cetera, et cetera. So they're run, they're got drugs running through their bodies at such a young age, and then at the same time, physicians come on to see them, but the only way they see them is via Zoom. They never get uh, physically in front of a person or one of the young people to to look at them, to talk to them about uh, issues in terms of medicine or whatever they're dealing with. And then they prescribe psychotropic medications that, that, that mess with your mind and, you know, combine with these other drugs that they're already taking you know, he, he was talking about some of these young guys. You know, he mentioned this. You know, they can't even get an erection because of the drugs they're, they're on. So they're being medicated, not getting any kind of social skills. So when they do 
come out of these prisons and these facilities, what's their mentality coming out? They're almost yeah. trained to be they're trained to be predators. And then mm. and then the other the other issue is if you if you're looking at the facility coming in and out of the facility every day, and thank God for the principal, our brother who brought this to the uh, attention. Why hasn't something been done about it? It ain't like the mold grew one. What they left one day and the next day it was filled with mold. This stuff had to be happening over some time. It's not like yeah. all of these facilities got just got soot or whatever other issues they're dealing with, but nobody has looked into it. Why? Is it yeah. because they really don't care? You know, I'm. You know, this man has been raising his voice about it. Nobody's come in to deal with it. But now I understand that they are. The governor has responded. They are uh, addressing the issue. Somebody's mic is open, uh, some background issues. But uh, those are some of the things that he's concerned about. And we're still waiting for our sister, Lakeisha. Okay. If she's on, let's, let's bring our sister, Lakeisha, in, please. Sister Lakeisha, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, how you doing? Thank you for joining us. This is uh the the show is straight straight words with Richard now by Richard Muhammad who was on and B J Murphy, two very distinguished uh journalists and brothers in radio in the radio field. So brother, say hello to uh just Lakeisha. So Lakeisha, how you doing? Let her, let her hear I'm your doing voice. good. How are you? Welcome to the show. Well, Sister Mama Lincoln, sister, we're we're looking uh, forward very much from hearing from you. Go yes. ahead, Brother James. It's your yes. thing. Uh, Mr. Keisha, uh, since Keisha and I uh, also used to work together, I have a lot of respect for the Keisha. She's a formerly a, uh, a nursing home worker, and we worked together. I was at, at our union, SEIU Healthcare. She was a dynamic organizer there. Did a lot of work, a lot of fighting for rights for our workforce. We uh, backed her in her run for uh, state representative, and she won. And now she has moved on to becoming a state senator and a very good one at that. Uh, the principal uh, and Brother Damon Dash was very happy to uh, – it didn't take much to get her support. One phone call, and she was on the scene. And so, uh, Sister Lakeisha, thank you for joining, and I'll just let you take over. Can you just give – I don't know how much you heard – of us talking about the issue, but what are your observations about the IYC, the juvenile detention facility, and uh, some of the things that you are trying to make happen there? And before you talk, uh, 773-591-1690 is the number to get in on this call. Please call in. Go ahead, Sister Lakeisha. Uh, Thank you, Brother Muhammad. Um, You know, so... I just want to go back a little bit. So I was the state representative, and in the Senate district, you have two districts. So I represented the sister district to the new district I picked up. It was the ninth district I represented, and the 10th district is the new district I picked up as the state senator, senator, which IYC Chicago sits in. And so I was not aware um, of the conditions over there, had no clue that this stuff was going on. And one day... um, one of my colleagues who was a senator, someone who I admire, she reached out to me and she said, hey, there's a lot of stuff going on over there. I don't know if your predecessor has visited this facility, you know, during her time there. But someone named Mr. Dash reached out to me and was telling me about the principal there. But at that time, it was supposed to be low profile. He, he didn't want to be exposed at the time from what I was told. And she was like, hey, give him a call. I know this is your wheelhouse. I'm going to take your lead on this. Because we had just made some appointments um, to some new positions in the Senate. And I think he was the acting, the new director is the acting director. And so I ended up giving Mr. McGrone a call. And the things he was telling me was so disturbing that I just stopped. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to head over there right now. Like, I'm, I'm supposed to go and meet with the mayor at the time. And I told my staff, I said, hey, cancel that event with the mayor. We're going to head over here to IYC Chicago because there's some disturbing information I found out, and I want to go see for myself. And in my district, when I was a state rep, I always used to do pop-up visits anyway, right? 
So I said, this wouldn't be out of the norm for me, but I want to see, I want to see what's going on. I want to talk to the young people. And so uh, for those who don't know my background, I came from a very toxic environment. Um, I know what it's like when someone who's supposed to love you, you know, tell you all of these things that, you know, no adult should tell a child. And so, you know, I've had all of these experiences, so I take it very personal when it comes to the mistreatment of our young people and our elders. And so I went over there, and they were kind of stalling me at the door because I guess everyone was in St. Charles, you know, introducing some new things that was going on there. And so the head of security was the one in, you know, charge there. And he was kind of giving me the runaround, and I'm like, look, I'm a state official. This is in my district. I want to take a tour now. And so I got on the phone, made a call to their liaison. He got me access in the building. And being a nursing home worker, I can tell when a facility is short staffed from yeah. the way it smells, the way it looks. And so as I'm walking through, I'm just paying attention to the, vent, the vents. I'm paying attention to the walls. I'm paying attention to the open wires. And as he's talking to me, pretty much I felt like he was trying to distract me from what mm. I really wanted to see. So I'm like, you know what? Take me to the D unit. When I got on the mm. unit, I mean, them young people were very open, very articulate about their experience. They didn't care that staff was on the unit with them when they were telling me what was going on. And I didn't even know about the B unit <laughs> until one of the young people were like, hey, are you going to go see the B unit? And I said, of course. I'm looking at the shower rooms, and I'm like, this is black mold. Like, how long has this stuff been here? It didn't just grow here. I'm looking at the smoke detector. I'm listening to them telling me about, you know, how the wire, the um, electric system is down, how they were afraid that if a fire break out, they wouldn't be able to get off the unit, um, how everything had to be open manually. And I'm like, yeah, that's a concern. And then I started hearing stories about um, – some of the abuse that was happening to them at other facilities and even in that facility. And so I'm getting upset because I'm just like, I can't believe that this is going on right under our nose and no one has said anything other than this principal. And apparently the ombudsman knew what was going on. She made reports. She was very open about mm -hmm. that. Um, and just nothing ever happened. And so I visited all the units even the units where they had young people isolated in. Um, and they all told me their stories. I looked every last one in there in their eyes. I have three sons myself, 18, 15, and 11. So I saw my son in all of them. And one thing that, the things that stuck out to me the most is when one of the young men said to me, if they take us from my mom living in these conditions, why are we living in these conditions? I mean, they had, you could see the physical, you know, impact that the ventilation had on them, the impact of, you know, the medication. Um, I mean, it was just a lot. I mean, me and my staff, I have a full women staff, and when we left from there, we all felt this sense of, like, what in the world is going on? And so for me, it's like the stigma that we have in society against our young adults who are in custody has become the norm. People feel like, oh, they've done wrong. They deserve to be punished. They know, they're aware that they've done something wrong, that they was at the wrong place at the wrong time, or they have committed a crime, and they understand that they're supposed to be punished. But they're not supposed to be living in inhumane conditions. I mean, there were some kids that said they hadn't been outside in two years. And as a Black mother, as a Black person, I know that you're supposed to be exposed to some form of, fun, you know, sunlight, clean did air. You see, did you see any place where there would be sun coming? Because from the outside, all you see is a few small windows. Was there any way where the, the sunlight could seep through or they could gather, you know, at least like a... No, a, 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 no. Nowhere? They had and, some, and, some of the, the lights in the facility covered up with covered paper because a lot of them complained of the brightness of the light. A lot of them complained that they couldn't sleep because of the dripping of the um, showers that were apparently, you know, it was evident they really were broke. Um, they were pointing out a lot of the stuff that I guess, you know, the head of security was trying to hide. They were like, no, go in there. Look, look right here. We used to drink from this fountain, which was a very inhumane, um, you know, mop room, I guess, that they had folks drinking from. They did install a new fountain. 
they were supposed to have water on the unit, but they were not practicing that. Um, when I say I toured every space in that building, I toured every space. And I'm not going to say that I'm not naive to the fact that it's a warehouse. Someone had the bright idea in the 90s that this is a place we can store young people. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, they just continued that practice. Mm-hmm. But I okay. more so cared about the workers having to breathe in that condition and work in that condition, but also those young people who clearly um, expressed that, you know, it was just a, a, it's an unlivable environment. And so, you know, I, I tell people all the time, you know, what you put into a young person is what you're going to get back into the world. And so if we're really talking about rehabilitating these young people, it has to be a holistic approach. Their mental wear and tear you know, the fact that they don't have, you know, social workers who can speak to them, who relate to them, Um, you know, a healthcare system where they're checking their blood pressure or seeing them in person, talking to them in private, you know, it just, it's a lot of things that I felt was wrong. And anybody who knows me, I'm very vocal. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to be very transparent about what I've seen. And I mean, I couldn't even sleep after those visits. Like, Mm-hmm. What's that? If there, if there was some telling you that they haven't been outside in a year, I mean, does that go for everybody? Is there a place that they can go? Do they get outside at all? Does at any point? So there are end, some, some yeah, there are some young people who they consider to be the good ones that they'll let go on like basketball trips or stuff like that, right? When they get sponsors to take them, but I got down to the point where they would say, "Oh, it's because of lack of staffing." or because of whatever crime they committed. But there is a back area where they can take those young people where they said they have taken young people in the past, but the current ones that are there, they had not been down there, right? Mm -hmm. And again, it's because of staffing. And so even when you go back there, you can tell it hasn't been utilized in a long time. But since I've been there, Mm -hmm. I heard today from Mr. McGrone that they finally let some of them outside. It shouldn't have took Mm -hmm. me to go to the facility and expose it for them to get some of the services that they need, right? Yes, mm-hmm, yeah. It just should have never took that. And so, you know, um, what I don't want to happen is that it become politicized and we take away the young people's voices because they've been lied to for so long and they've been dis- they've been let down for so long that they feel as though no one's going to help them because they've been reaching out. And now they have someone in the building, like Mr. McGrone, who has, you know, stood on his word you know, from every step of the way that they feel that finally their voices are getting heard. So some of these issues are being addressed, but it shouldn't have took this to get to that point. But that's, that's why representation question. matters, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the fact that it took you to get there, like, I don't, I mean, you may not have an answer, but that was one of my questions. Why would it take this long? And this is not, it, this, like you said, this did not just happen. So this, they have known about this for some time, uh, and you're not the first person they approached. Is it that, you know, whatever levels of city that they went to, they just don't care about this, or they were approached in the wrong way? What could be the reason? So I tell everybody this, because um, I, I do this with my staff, too. The governor, the lieutenant governor, they're governor in the whole state. So these directors who are in these positions, they are to report what's going on. There are people who come to the legislature all the time asking for money, asking for increases. I'm just trying to figure out why no one said, hey, these are unlivable conditions. We cannot keep them housed here. I'm concerned about their health long-term. I'm concerned about their mental health long-term. They have complained about being abused or whatever the case may be. Like physically, I can see this young guy, I won't disclose his name because that's HIPAA, but from the time I visited them that first week when I did the pop-up visit to the next week when I came back with more visitors with me just to, you know, take a look at the mold and, you know, talk to the young people to think of new ways of how we can help stimulate their mind and help them, you know, um, get some comfort level. This young guy said, like, they beat our butt, you know what I'm saying, because we talked. Mm. And so it's like... You can't retaliate on these young people because they're speaking their truth. Because now you're putting more hate into them. So when they get released, 
they're going to go right back into the street. They're going to go right back and do the same thing again. I had a young person tell me literally like, ma'am, if I go back out there, I'm going to, I'm going to die anyway. Mm. I had a mark on my head. I'm going to die anyway. The young people in there is like, I was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. I should listen to my mom. But they're getting mm. slammed in these, uh, mm. these in central Illinois. They're getting slammed. Some of them are doing the same. They, they get, they're getting charged with the same crime. If they're in Cook County, it's less. But if they're getting charged down in Carbondale, it's way more. They get 40 to 70 years for the same thing somebody did in Cook County. These young people have no way out. Mm. And then we wonder why they go right back in. What was the racial then, makeup of the of the of the individual? Majority black. Majority black. Were they male, female, or just all males? Or? Male. This is all a male male facility. There's a young ladies facility in Warrenville. I'm going to pop up there too. Mm-hmm. I feel that we need to start popping up on these places, and we need to listen to the people who are impacted, no matter how harsh it is. Mm-hmm. You can't say you care about people, and you allow things like this to get swept under the rug. You just can't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 773-591-1690 if you have a question or a comment on this issue. Sister, uh, Lakeisha, again, thanks for calling. Um, if you have a few minutes, kind of, is there uh, next steps like that you're looking at taking? I know you expressed them to the governor. Uh, they have responded. Um, can you give us an uh, update? Yeah, so I did speak Wait, to the governor. Um, okay, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? I did speak yeah. to the governor about this. Um, he he was not happy at all. Um, the main thing he said was, I'm, I'm about to get on this right now, right? And so immediately I started hearing about a lot of the changes that was happening over there, which let me know that he was not playing. <laughs> but again, it shouldn't have had to take for me to do that. And I'm not trying to bash anybody, but I, I keep saying representation matters. It matters who your representative is. It matters when they show up. It matters when, you know, this person have a lived experience in the work that they're doing, you know. And I see it all the time where people, they get on the microphone and they say, hey, I care, I care, I care. No, you can't care if you allow for this to go on for so long and you said nothing, right? You can't care. You you can't say that, you know, um, you're passionate about something and you just throw it underneath the rug. So when I talked to him and I talked to the lieutenant governor staff, you know, immediately she sent out the fire marshals to check in on the fire detectors, the uh, carbon monoxide detectors, because visibly they were not there. Um, and, you know, I knew just by looking at them that they had not been checked in. I don't know how long. This landlord is a slumlord at the end of the day. He's a slumlord. Um, but it's the duty of the people who work there to say something. And a lot of these jobs where you are taking care of other human beings, and, and Mr. Muhammad, James Muhammad, you know this about me, you know, from being a healthcare worker. You, yeah. You're the spokesperson for the person that you're caring for. You see something, you say something. It's more than just receiving a check. Because yeah. now these, these workers, they're, they're exposed to the same thing. You're breathing this every day. It was clear that the ventilation was jacked up. I mean, it was black dust everywhere on the mm-hmm. ceiling. When I came back mm-hmm. that next week, it was clean as day. But I know internally mm-hmm. it was still messed up with the duct system, right? Mm-hmm. Because I was in there for an hour, and I was like, my eyes was getting red. I had a headache, you know. So imagine mm-hmm. young people living there, sleeping and breathing that every single day. Mm-hmm. Imagine the ones who were there before them and the ones who were there before them, right? You're driving them crazy. They can't sleep, so now you're giving them melatonin. And that's what I ask. They- all of them got the same mental health issue? Mm-hmm. They all came here with the same problem? Mm-hmm. It makes no sense. And Principal McGrone said that the recidivism rate there is off the hook. He sees the same. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess he said uh, one in three of them uh, return. They come right uh, back. Within five months. Yeah, they come right back. And, and I talked to one of the young guys who came back, and even the aftercare, the after service, you know, um, and it's not to bash nobody, and I don't know how this man, you know, handles them after care. But I asked the young man, I said, why are you back here? And he literally said, because I don't care for this guy. He only follows up with me when he, I guess, got a 
turn to his support. And when he don't see me, then he reports me. Uh, so, again, you have these adults in their lives who are not being honest. And you have some folks there who really do care. I had people giving me, you know, you know, thumbs up because they were afraid to speak up. But they were like, thank you for saying something. Thank you for showing up. At any time, yeah. workers feel that intimidated to say something, then you know it's deeper than that. Yeah. And I feel that you know, as an adult, it's our duty to report when something is not right. Because these are the same kids that will get out because they didn't get the rehabilita- rehabilitation services that they needed. And they're going to go back into survival mode. A lot of these kids out here are in survival mode. They're coming mm-hmm. from environments that probably are abusive, neglectful, probably because mom or dad had to work two or three jobs just to make ends meet. So they're raising themselves. A lot of these young kids who join gangs, they join them for what? They're looking for love. They're looking for family. They're looking for connection. The gangs are not how they were back in the day. They have mutated into something totally different. There's no accountability, no rules, no nothing. nothing. Right? Right. So now they're inside of there. They're getting pretty much the same treatment. Then they're coming out. There's no, they have no sense of accountability, no self-control. They have not learned anything about what they've been in there for. And so now you get another carjacking. You get another shootout. You get another fight. But it is what and, you have uh, put into them while they were there that they're going to give back out to the world. Yeah. And, no, uh, sister. And, no, go ahead, but James. Yeah, lastly, I'd like to jump in. But Principal McGrone, he even expressed this to uh, Lakeisha that he's go- he knows he's going to feel retribution for being, quote, unquote, a whistleblower on this case, uh, why would people want to punish him for raising this ish, issue that is about safety? Uh, you know, what does that say about the facility? I don't know who he's referring to, but, you know. I don't he, think he so, but, you know, I think that Ms. McGrone, you know, and it's natural when you have someone who is a whistleblower because the automatic response would be retaliation. It would be to get rid of them. Um but I, find, I honestly feel, and I'm just very optimistic, that that's not the case with him. The fact that he came out publicly and said, hey, it's me. I made the report. I'm the one who connected myself to Senator Collins. I'm the one who's reporting all these things. I told you all, you all didn't do anything, so I had to go outside and, do, and get some help. I don't think that would be the case because it would be too obvious, but I just honestly don't feel that would be the case. I think that he's actually doing a due justice. Because obviously someone wasn't telling the administration what was going on. What was going on? Yeah, yeah. And, and that, he got that's you just having his back opinion. too. And he got you having his back. So that's yeah, that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, sister, um, I'm just hearing about this case, but I gotta be very frank. I'm less optimistic because to me, the system don't move unless you make it move. And mm-hmm. you made it. That's what happened. Ain't nobody just have no change of heart and they just woke up. No, you went down there and you made it happen. Because I'm looking at a report from from 2022 from Injustice Watch, which says mm-hmm. most juvenile detention centers in Illinois are failing to meet the standards. I mean, that's what was published by. It was published by Illinois. Uh, Brother Naba, hold on. We got some. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I could, we could hardly hear you. Cause I guess it was something you wanted to oh, hold Go on. ahead. No, no, you no, I think it was somebody else. Yeah, I thought it was. Another. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. So, so I'm mean, real quick. This report says most juvenile detention centers in Illinois, or this article says, are failing to meet state standards. Audit reports show juvenile detention centers across the state are overusing room confinement, providing insufficient insufficient mental health services to youth in custody, among other issues. Well, the audit <laughs> was conducted by the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice. They did the damn, I'm not going to cuss, they did the audit. So you did an, an audit or an analysis, which means you came up with some actual facts and then what you do. But that's okay, because we're going to be looking at this. And we don't care where the chips fall. We don't give a 
good Don down a mess. Yeah, I hear you, brother. Because, because, and, and, and this brother that came forward, we shouldn't wait for him to be retaliated against. We got to build a fence around him now because these people are beasts. And maybe they don't fire him today, but maybe they just keep on and on and on. You know how they move? So, sister, thank you so much because you did what a public servant is supposed to do. You delivered true public service. Yes, he is a true public thank service. Thank you for that. And a quality organizer. Uh, so, sister, uh, Lake- Brother BJ, you need, it, you need to get in? Well, we got we got about three okay. callers. I don't know if we can get them in oh. real quick. You want to try to get, get a couple people? Yeah, in? let's get some callers. Uh, yeah, okay. y'all got to let okay. us know. Okay. Okay. okay, everybody hung up. We, um, we can, we can, if if call, <coughs> if you call, call. <coughs> I'm sorry. If you call, call back. And sister, yeah, and, and if, you they, with us, if if you could hang with us for a few minutes. We'll let this leach a little bit into the 10 o'clock hour, okay? If so if you call, time. call back. If yeah. you call, and When they come on, we got to know. Yeah. 773-591-1689. So, so, if you call, call back again now. Yeah. Sister uh, Lakeisha, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. can you just tell us a little bit, uh, little bit more about your district? Where... Uh, what, what's the boundaries yeah. uh, and what mm-hmm. are some of the things that you're highlighting to get accomplished in your, I think this is your first year, as a, uh, your first term, right? As a Yeah, as so I was a state rep from 2020 until um, August of 2023. And then I got uh, appointed in August, on August 15th when my predecessor, Van Pelt, stepped down. And I've been there for, it's what, almost eight months now? As a state senator, and so I picked up this district. Um, of course, it's a political season, but it's also our government time, too. <laughs> and so for people who don't know, because um, I, I take a lot of time explaining to people the process, because I think it's important that people know what their elected official is responsible for so that the expectations don't be, you know, I would say unrealistic, and I hope that's not offending anybody, but a lot of the times I get concerns about city stuff, and I'm like, I can link you to who your alderman is. I can link you to the city services, but my main, you know, duties are state highways, state police, state, you know, government. I make legislation. I pass state budget, right? That funds a lot of the different agencies around the state. But also, I invest in a lot of the violence and prevention stuff, workforce development. You know, we give a lot of grants and things like that or funding to the city, or municipalities across the state. And so there's just different functions, and I always try to explain it to people. So my district stretches from, I have communities like West and East Garfield Park now. I'm getting to know that community. I have North Lawndale, know them very well. I have the near west side, so I have that entire West Loop area, Fullerton Market, um, Greek Town, Old Town, Gold Coast, Bucktown, Wicker Park, um, the Old Cabrini Green, which is called River North now, um, a tip of Lincoln Park. I mean, this district is huge. Yeah. It's 217,000 constituents. I always tell people I'll never meet everybody. This job is part-time. We only legislate from January until the end of May. But I use this as full-time. So I don't have another job. I don't have a special interest. I'm strictly beholden to my district. And when I'm home in June, if I'm not spending time with my kids or bringing them with, uh, with me to an event, I'm in the district. I'm knocking doors still. Even on an off election season, I'm knocking doors, introducing myself, making sure people have my contact information because I want to make sure they have access to me so that when things happen in my district, I'm aware of it and I can check up on it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's just how I operate. And, James, you know me. I'm very Um, hands-on. And I think that's what a lot of other people, you know, tend to not understand about me is that I want to be involved. I want to know what's happening. I want to be a part of what's going on in my district. It's my duty. That's what I'm sworn to do. I can't change things overnight, but in a situation like this, I wasn't going to let this fly underneath my nose and not do anything. I immediately got on the phone. I immediately, you know, went up the ladder and said, hey, this is going on. I don't know about this person. I don't know about that person. We need to open up an investigation over here. 
we need to get this, some stuff resolved because one thing I don't want to do is lie to people. And I looked every last one of those young men in their face. I shook their hand. I sat with them. And I said, I am going to make sure your complaints are addressed. And so for them to see that these things are being changed right before their eyes, it lets them know that this is one person that did not like to me. Mm. Yeah. You know. Well, yeah. yeah, and if you get a call, let us know. But uh, uh, just talk briefly. You mentioned this at the rally in conversation with Brother uh, Dash and some of the others, Chairman uh, Hampton and, and others. You talked about the political process and whether, you know, folks, you, you have an interest or a vested interest in the political process. You talked about getting involved in it and mm-hmm. just reflecting on your nursing home background and how we used to take dozens and dozens of nursing home workers okay. to, to Illinois, to, to, to the Capitol, to get to talk to the legislators, and it did produce change it, it, to the point where we now have two former nursing home workers from the union uh, working in state government as as representative or senator. So just briefly, just mention about how you were talking about that. Uh, if you want to see change, whether yeah. you believe in or have trust in the process or not, you can get things accomplished, but you got to get in, uh, mm-hmm. you know, get in front of folks. Yes. So I, so there may be some people listening that probably won't agree with me. I'm okay with that. I'm I'm the same way I have been since I was a CNA and before I was a CNA. I'm just going to keep it real. What I've seen changed over the years, just as a young person, um, is that people are now more and more becoming more focused on the party. You're either Republican or Democrat. That's the failure right there. Yeah. We have to be interested in the person on who fits our best interest. That's it. Who aligns with our call? That's it, right? A lot of people don't know the process. So people have expectations. You work for me. You're, you're, you're in government. I elected you. So you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to do that. I tell people all the time, you think racism stopped in the community that I was in the community with you with? It still happened in the legislature. It still happens in the municipality. It still happens in the city council. There's still this barrier there there's still a big disproportion for black elected officials and non-black elected officials. That's just the reality of it. It's systemic. It's all about numbers. Mm. I don't have a lot of my constituents on that west side of the district coming to Springfield to talk to any of the legislators, any of the leaders of the House and the Senate about things that they want to see in their community. And that's just a fact. Back in the day, I used to hear stories about busloads of folks coming down to rally about projects or funding for certain things in addition. That spirit has kind of faded off a little bit because people have, and and I'm going to say this, if you work in two or three jobs to make end meet, you ain't got time to get on the bus to go to Springfield. If you could barely put food on your table, you ain't got time to come to Springfield. So it's a partnership. It's not just me as an elected official. I can't do it without you. We got to work together. If I'm down here screaming and hollering about what's going on in one of the communities in my district, I need the people to back me on that because now I become a target. And then you lose out on having somebody who's truly about representing you. And then now you got to start all over again because as a state rep, we run every two years, really a year and a half. So you don't really get to dig into the work like that either. So you keep switching the elected officials, you starting all over again. Because now your projects don't hold from the predecessor. Now you got to try to figure out how to pass bills. You got to figure out how to get stuff in the budget. So now your community is still stagnated. You're still behind. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? And I'm just yeah. somebody personally who don't believe in staying in oh. one spot for too long. Okay. That's just yes. me. Look, Keisha. Yeah. We're, yeah. We're, I didn't even notice this, but we're at the top, coming to the top of the hour. Uh, I don't know. Can you just hold for a few till we come back off? And if we have a few mm-hmm. callers, we'll deal with that over. So, sure. But Brother BJ, um, sure. All right. I didn't realize it All right. right up there. All right. Well, Senator Collins, thank you so much for dropping that information about the IYC Chicago. We'll get some phone calls there at 773-591-1690. At the top of the hour, we got more on straight words right here on WBON 1690, the talk of Chicago, y'all.
The talk of Chicago and the voice of the nation is 1690 WVON, Berwyn, Chicago. Vanessa Tyler. And I'm Mike Stevens on your home for 24-7 News, the Black Information Network. Shots fired in the Big Easy. When the gun smoke cleared, a black woman dead, 11 others injured. It happened in a nightclub in the New Orleans always hopping towards district. It was especially busy over the weekend with the French Quarter Fest, but someone ruined it all by pulling out a gun. Tourists in nearby hotels tell Fox 8 they heard the barrage of fire in the middle of the night. But we were in bed, and it, it sounded like someone was, like, banging on our door. Like, that's how loud it was. And then you just hear people screaming and alarms and sirens, and it was insane. And then people, like, running up the street, like, saying, she's dead, she's dead. Sadly, family identified the woman found lying dead on the sidewalk as 24-year-old Jazreel Aquila Polate. A massive New Orleans police investigation continues. Waiting for the Israeli response now that Iran has sent hundreds of missiles and exploding drones to Israel, all the incoming intercepted by Israel with the help of American forces. African-American military leaders, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Charles Brown, led the national security team advising President Biden. The U.S. says it stands with Israel but will not participate in any retribution against future attacks by Israel against Iran. This is going down in history, the first time ever a former president of the United States ever stood for a criminal trial. As the jury selection begins, many potential jurors in deep blue Manhattan already dismissed, admitting they could not be impartial. Trump recycled his usual complaints. It's a scam. It's a political witch hunt. It continues and it continues forever. And we're not going to be given a fair trial. It's a very, very sad thing. He's already predicting a loss in the hush money case brought by the Manhattan, New York office of Alvin Bragg, the African-American prosecutor who is not backing down. Bragg sees it as election interference and falsifying business records, accusing Trump of right before the 2016 election, paying off an adult film star to shut her up about their affair. As Donald Trump seethes in anger over his court case, President Biden is enjoying the results of a new poll, showing Biden's approval rating is the highest since November. The poll from the Financial Times and the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business shows Biden's approval rating at 42 percent. That's a 4 percent increase from March. But the poll also found 41 percent of voters trust former President Trump over President Biden when it comes to the economy. A Nigerian woman has started a company that helps on so many levels. Afed Alapo Ruchiwe has started a tire recycling company. Tires pile up in Nigeria, useless except for the malaria spreading mosquitoes breeding in them. Business Insider reports now the tires are collected, shredded, and made into rubber bricks to be used in Nigerian driveways and on playgrounds for Nigerian children. I'm Vanessa Tyler with Mike Stevens on your home for 24-7 News, the Black Information Network. It's Matt McGill. Coach Izzo, how you doing? I assume you've already started some of your early scouting on uh, UCLA, USC, Oregon. Who else is about to join the Big Ten? Washington. We got four of them, and who knows, by the time we're done, maybe the Celtics in the mix. I mean, <laughs> this is insanity, what's going on, but it is what it is. So we'll, uh... Matt McGill, weekdays at 1 p.m. on the Talk of Chicago, 1690 WVON. Hi, it's Tavis Smiley, inviting you to join me weeknights, 6 to 9 p.m., right here on WVON. I'll bring a national perspective to all things happening in black America. It's talk the way you like it, and it's why America is listening. It's the legendary Tavis Smiley, weeknights at 6 p.m. on the Talk of Chicago, 1690 WVON. Tune in every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. for Speak On It with Dr. Kofi Malik. You've seen him on cable TV. Now hear his spirited conversation on the talk of Chicago. The question at hand is raising voices of the Negro. That plain and simple. Tune in every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. for Speak On It with Dr. Kofi Malik on the talk of Chicago. 1690 WVON. 
What up, VON? It's your boy. It's Kendall Moore. I'm from the Kendall Moore Show. You already know. Join me every Friday evening from 6 until 9 p.m. on 1690 AM. That is WBON. Cheers. Tune in Friday, 9 to midnight for The Fundamentals, where I, Titus T. Dell Williams, bring the mental. Thanks, Captain Obvious. And I, DJ Turbine at Turo Garza, bring the fun. Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? So if you want some wacky, some good conversation, but some fun, and a little serious, for all your sports needs, tune in to The Fundamentals. Friday nights, 9 to midnight. We'll see you there. You like that? You like that? Hey Alexa, play WVON 1690 AM. Getting WVON 1690 AM station from iHeartRadio. Try it out for yourself. America is listening to WVON. From the Xfinity Studios at WVON, we are the talk of Chicago. 1690 WVON. Hey brothers and sisters, we're back. Straight words on WVON from 9 p.m. until midnight. Brother Nabar Richard Muhammad, Brother James D. Muhammad, Brother B.J. Murphy, we're here. And don't forget, you can support us financially. Go to our cash app, dollar sign straight words, dollar sign straight words on cash app. Make a donation tonight and help us stay on the air. Also on Zelle, 312-480-9775. That's 312-480-9775. And on PayPal, it is straight words, the number four, at uh, gmail.com. So you want us to continue to bring you content like this every Tuesday night. Support us, brothers and sisters, by going to make a donation tonight. All right, brother. Let's get back to our great conversation tonight about the I- IYC Chicago. Senator Collins is holding on, and we got a couple of phone calls, Brother James G. Yes, sir. Well, we're going to let Sister Collins go, but we're going to get Cliff in first uh, if he has a comment for us. This is like uh, Senator Collins, and uh, then we'll let her get her last word in. She's had a very important event. We don't want to hold it too long. And we do thank you, uh, Senator Collins, for being on. Brother Cliff, what say you? You have a question for our hey, senator? Uh, yeah, I'm from the family. Thank well, you so look. much for taking my call. And I want to address the sister and then highlight some key points that she was saying. Number one, you know, she pretty much said that the conditions there are so bad, however, when the brothers come out, that they're okay. We're getting background. Hello. 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 I don't know what happened. He got drowned uh, out. Lakeisha, uh, I don't know where that background is coming from. There's some background noise. Uh, go ahead, Cliff. Let's see. If you can get it. Get it's it. coming from my background. I do have to get going, oh. but I'm oh, okay. listening. Yes, so I'm going to move my phone. All right. Well, let, before you, uh, do you have any last words how we can contact you and then you can listen to Brother Cliff? As he, is there any last comment or how we can contact you that you would like? To um, I would just say that I really highly recommend that, you know, any family who have a young person in the Department of Corrections or Juvenile Justice Center, check on your baby. Check on your baby. Yeah. Um, we need some type of community oversight on what's yeah. happening in these facilities. You know, again, the administrator can't do it on their own, but I just feel that we need more people, especially with programming, services. A lot of them just want to see somebody talk to them. But there's a lot of stuff that needs to change, and we need to get rid of a lot of the bureaucracy that's happening there, too. Um, But I appreciate everyone for, you know, tuning in. James, all of you for showing up um, on Friday. I took a a three-and-a-half-hour drive getting back home to make sure I was yeah. there. It was a mess, but at the end of the day, you know, the lieutenant governor, she showed up yesterday. And so I just think that um, we're on the right path, but there's a lot more to do, but we got to protect Brother McGrone and make sure that yeah. he's lifted. And anybody who considers themselves to be the whistleblower or the whistleblower, a lot of times they might feel a little bit isolated, but in the end, the reward comes when change comes. And so if he had not stepped out, if Damon Dash have not stepped out and said anything, if, you know, my colleague, Senator Hunter, didn't call me, this wouldn't be happening right now. And so communication is key. And I just, you know, tell anybody, if you want to reach me, my office is 2165 
South Mill Lard right on the corner. You can reach me on social media, Senator Lakeisha Collins, or, you know, um, call my office, 312-298-9181. Um, whether you're in my district or not, um, I am somebody who can be a resource to you. But we have to make sure we keep a hold on our young people. Some of them never heard the word, I love you. We got to start showing more love to them. We have to. I remember when I was coming up, if no one poured good affirmations into me, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at right now. Honestly, I wouldn't. And I lost my mom when I was five. She was 28. So I had angels around me that kept telling me, you're going to be somebody despite what people told you. You're going to go somewhere. And if I didn't have that type of community around me, strangers who became family, I would not be where I'm at today. So we're going to have to get back control of our community and love on our young people, no matter how hard it is to get through to them. we got to break those barriers and, and really show them that we're there for them, no matter what, because they are not waking up shooters. They're not waking up carjackers. They're not waking up murderers. This is a result of what is being poured into them and their environment and decades long of disinvestment in our community. Yeah. Thank you. So you get what you thank give. You. All right. Thank you all. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. Thank Great. you. Appreciate Bye. you very much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bye. Look, uh, sorry, but she had to go. She was giving. She was very grateful to give us the time that we had. But go ahead, and uh, she, hopefully she might be still listening on her her phone. I'll tell you, brothers. Uh, I'll try to be. I'll try yeah, to be brief. That system was right on point, and I just want to highlight some key things that she said. You know, in terms of the conditions at the facility, sometimes are that deplorable. However, what she indicated was that. In some of these individuals' home lives, it's even worse. So it's like it's almost a, you know, a, a, a asset being locked up and incarcerated. They get food. They get protection, you know, even though it might not be the best, but it's worse even in their own community because they might even lose their lives. That's one thing. The second thing she said in terms of, you know, our community, you know, is, is that our black community where she's trying to do her best, right, and she's looking for support coming from the black community. The brothers and sisters ain't there. You know, you're, you're yeah. hanging out. To, you're hanging out in the nightclub. You know, you're going out to the jazz fest. You're doing all that. You know, when it comes down to politics and support the sisters, you know, what I'm saying she's looking back. Ain't nobody there. You know, and then finally yeah. she's saying that it's not Democrats or Republicans. She's saying that she would support and need those who have an interest. Issues. You know what I'm saying? So, so, so these are. So when you get Brother Art talk about family values and people get tired of hearing that, you know, he's absolutely right. And this is something, man, we can't all necessarily blame the white man. You know, man, this is stuff that we got to deal with. And if our brothers and sisters, particularly our young brothers, if they can't be turned around, bro, we're going to have more violence, more separation, more degradation, not coming from the white man. Not coming from our enemies, but coming from within. Right. And how do we yeah. deal with that? You know yeah, what I'm saying, man? It's so frustrating, bro. You know what I mean? So, yo, we got to do better, man. Thanks for taking my call. Yeah. So I'm a Lakin brother. Yeah, no, thank you hey. for and your support. Yeah. And your support. And uh, yeah. you know, we have people out there doing good as well. We just got to get all of us that are trying to do the, the best to, to get together as well to try to spread yeah. the good. So, um, and so and uh, I, I thought. Support. I thought I heard a different point, Brother James, which uh-huh. was the young people saying to her, I couldn't be in my mama's home in these conditions, yeah. but mm. you got me in these conditions right here. Yeah, That's what right. I thought. I heard her saying. And mm. and uh, uh, our brother makes some great points. And brothers and sisters, that's one of the reasons why we do what we do. Gil Scott Heron said the revolution will not be televised meaning that we all got a role to play. The sister said, you get back what you give. So if we don't intervene in the lives of our children in the midst of a savage, ruthless society, right. a society with no compassion, a society with no morals, a society with, with that is, they, man, our young people ain't stupid. That's right. When you send them to this, when you send them to that institution, you know what you're teaching them? 
only the strong survive, and you better look out for your damn self, because ain't nobody looking for out for you. Ain't nobody honest. Ain't nobody doing their job. And, and you're a fool if you think you're going to get it like that. Yeah, because they haven't been shown the love that, I mean, she made a point, uh, and we always say this, but for me, you know, I go back a little bit longer than, than you guys, but it was a community even uh, back back in the day when I was growing up because we were, you know, as they quote unquote the projects, everybody you could just walk down the street, walk in your neighbor's house, get you something to eat, or and your neighbor could could discipline you, take you up to your your your, your parents. There was some genuine. We had issues, but there was some genuine love there, and uh, of course you had some that didn't get the breaks, but a lot of us did. And so those of us who did, we got to, like, each one teach one. And that's what we're about, especially in the nation, man, It's each one teach one. We recognize who we are, and we respect who we are. We want to make others respect the God that is within them. And so uh, we just got to we just gotta spread the love. And, and we got to understand, as you say, Brother Naba, there's, we're one force working one way, but there's another force working the other way. Keeping right. our community divided. And if you don't recognize that, you're going to fall for the okie doke every time. Because he's a skillful enemy. Very yeah, skillful. that's right. He can, he can lie right. to you and tell you that water is dry, and you would believe it. We used to say the white man's <laughs> ice is colder. Colder, that's yeah. That's why we would go to his. I mean, to even say something like that shows a level, you know, of ignorance. And so, you know, we got, we, we got a challenge just to reach our own people who grow up in poverty, who grow up uh, uninformed, miseducated. That's a big leap to to get to, to jump up to get to just to reach the person. And that's the, uh, the value of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's message. His message yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, the initially, I mean, the, the, the first converse were those who – who knew they were in hell, hmm. you know, and That's wanted right. to get out of hell, you know. Yes, sir. Well, yes, we got sir. our next yes, guest on for our, Oh, our yeah, we segment. got Brother uh, Cliff O, and we got your 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 segment, but now you want to go ahead. No, and, do, uh, do we still have Coleman, or are we clear? Yeah, call? is Coleman there? Okay. Well, they can get our okay. Coleman and, and Sammy in real, real quick, and then we'll go yeah, to our Yeah, let's do them quick. I guess. But James, go on and do your thing. Okay, man. go. But Coleman, what you got, brother? Welcome to the show. Straight words with uh, Nava Richard Muhammad, BJ Murphy, and James D. Muhammad. How are you doing today? Pretty good. How about you? Yes, sir. Man, we're blessed, and we're, we're thankful that you held on for so long. We apologize for it. And uh, oh, well, we want to hear no what you got to say. necessary here. In my yes, opinion, because uh, I appreciate the uh, information uh, in relates to that discussion about young people being locked up and forgotten. That's 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 so unnecessary. But we have to have that discussion. Yes, sir. You know, I I always say this. We have decided that it is okay for us to say it's okay to not have any empathy or compassion for the Negro family. And this is what has happened. Because we wasn't talking about having compassion and empathy for the Negro family. We were just simply saying, oh, we're not a monolithic people or community, but we should have been. And we still should be. 
but it's a difficult thing to do right now because we it seems like that wedge has been placed between people who feel like they're different from the Negro family. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Well, brother. Well, we thank you, brother. Um, man, uh, brother Coma, we always hear from you, and we appreciate your your wisdom that you share with us. And we um, we just hope that you can call in uh, as often as you can as you do. We do have another segment that we have got to move on to. Um. But thanks for calling, and um, call us again, okay? Okay. Uh, Brother right. Nelson, do you have your uh, your your – you ready? Oh, yeah, we have one more He's on the line. Okay. Yeah, we got okay. Sammy on the line. Let's get Brother Sammy in as well. But, uh, Coleman, thank you. Uh, Brother Sammy, how are you, sir? Oh, brother, I'm like I'm doing fine, bless by Allah. Just thank him, thank him for being here today. But uh, I just want to just chime in for 30, 60 seconds or less. Um, the event I, I attended Friday. Um, it was very, it was a very good informational session. Um, you know, um, I've worked in a facility uh, before, but I, um, but I just say this: I'm a product of a, a ward of the state and been in many facilities. As a young, um, and I'll just say with regards to the whistleblowing and and, and Michael's taking a, a position, and to um, what I heard Senator Collins state about, she made reference to the fact that she didn't. She alluded to well, I heard inference and in her saying that she didn't feel and and correct me if I'm wrong. And um, this is just some positive criticism, not even criticism. It's just an observation of what I heard is that she didn't feel that he would be targeted or our, our, our history, we were just, we, we know better than that. And I, I think um, Mike is going to need a lot of wraparound services because it's going to be a lot of mental stress. You know, one of his best defense or his protection. It's this. It's that saying. It's not. Um, it's not what you know. It's what you can prove. Documentation mm-hmm. is very important. I would say to the listening audience, you know, it would be good to have a HR attorney or get advice from an HR attorney, um, as well as you know, because he's going he's going to be on eggshells. You know, we already know that. But but it's, it's you know the the issue is it was beautiful that it's, it's brought to light because our children need. Advocate. Another point is that another reason why this has not been heard of is because you know people are on the job live in fear. They see wrong, they see it, and they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to say anything. They want somebody else to say something. Yeah. You know. So, um, but we, I think that this issue is brought to light, and now I do. And I don't need to say a whole lot because yeah. the great W. Uh, I mean, the great. You know, um, this show is, is is hitting on the issue. So there's so much Great I could words. say, but I'm not going to say. Is this, so, but it was good. This, it was good to be there, and um, and to thank God that the final call was there to cover it live. <laughs> uh, is this Stanley or Stanley? This is Stanley, right? Uh, yes, is sir. This? I did say this. Okay, because I thought he said Sammy. I thought he said Sammy. This is a great photographer, mm-hmm. brother Naba, and. BJ, this man is all over the city. He takes the, he's one of the best yeah. photographers I know in the city, and he's a, he's an Omega man too. So, shout out to Omega. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thanks, yeah. brother Stan. I'm I, 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 I one of a good photographer, but I got some good teachers as, yeah, as one of yeah, them. You, yeah, you, 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 you're in good company. <laughs> yeah, you're in good company. Haroon as well. Yes, sir. Yes, Thanks sir. for calling in, yeah. man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Brother Nob. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Again, call in 773-591-1690. Uh, 
um, we should have on the line, and we're going to get into this next segment. Uh, we got Laramie Griffin of Evolve Louisiana, who is with us on the case that we are highlighting and the case that we really are going to spend the remainder of the program talking about. Um, and that is the case of this 11-year-old girl in New Iberia, Louisiana, who was facing charges connected with a murder charge that her 15-year-old brother has. And I want us to listen very carefully, brothers and sisters. She was supposed to be um, sentenced today, but she was not. There was a continuance, which means they uh, decided to, they needed more time to resolve some things. We're going to have, God willing, Sister Charlene Muhammad, award-winning writer and broadcaster, um, and, based in Los An- and author based in Los Angeles, who will be on with us. And Sister Charlene will be giving us some of, of her reporting and, and her impressions. We're also going to be uh, joined at some point by Brother Rashad Muhammad, who's down in uh, New Iberia, um, and Brother Willie Muhammad, our student minister, minister from New Orleans, was there, sent at the personal instruction of Minister Farrakhan to go and see what he could find out. We're not playing with this, brothers and sisters, and we don't want you to play with you. Brother Laramie, you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Come on in. Is Sister Charlene also yes. in the in, in the building? Yes, sir. Yes, bring them both in. Assalamu alaikum, Sister. Assalamu Well, brother, brother Larry, let's let's get right into this. Um, uh, Evolve Louisiana has, has really been working hard, and I have to say, in collaboration with other groups, um, on. Uh, Today, right? The little girl was supposed to be sentenced, but she was not. Um, she got a plea deal where they said, and she pleaded in court guilty to obstruction of of justice, right? Um, Correct. Any, anyway, I'm 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 stunned by that. But let me let me try to do this real quick. Then, brother Larry, um, we'll get you in. Basically, she was arrested last year. Okay, the eleven-year-old girl. She was charged with murder because her white neighbor was found shot to death. Right, charged with murder. Now, the the police prosecutors eventually they got her fifteen-year-old brother and they charged him with murder. This young this young girl was held in prison. I'm not calling it no juvenile justice, nothing. It was a prison for over one. She's been there for over 100 days. Do you hear me? Mm. And 11 years old. Eventually, they got the they got the brother. He's charged. He's 15. He's charged with first degree murder now, and the mother is charged with being, I believe, an accessory to murder. I think she's got a bond of four hundred thousand dollars. So we want to start, brother Larry and sister Charlene. Let's start with what you all saw and experienced today. The little girl, like I said, had entered into a plea deal and she was supposed to be sentenced. Brother uh, Laramie, what, what, what are some of your thoughts about what happened today in that courtroom and outside the courtroom? So today, and thank you for having me on, uh, that flavor. Pre- appreciate you guys for continuing to let us speak the truth um, from our voices. So today we saw no lenity when it came to the incarceration of this 11-year-old black girl. The The buck continues to get passed from the district attorney and his prosecutors to the judge, and now it's on the Office of Juvenile Justice to come back with a recommended sentence of seven years with three and a half years suspended. But the Office of Juvenile Justice said, hey, we need a little bit more time. They are the only ones who weren't prepared today to get this mm-hmm. done because this is this 11-year-old girl, her life is at stake. Mm-hmm. You know, and she's way too young. She's 90 pounds soaking wet 
four feet tall and really, really not fully understanding what is going on, what is happening. Why is it taking so long? Why am I here? And we are overly frustrated. We are upset. And we are tired of these systems continuing to incarcerate our black children in these systems. Because let's get this one statistic out the way. 99% of the children in the juvenile justice system are black. 99%. And that's by design. So, I mean, my thoughts on it is that, like I said, it, it, they continue to pass the book to blame someone else for these things to keep prolonging and going on because as of today, she's been incarcerated for 140 days. Mm. And to see her in an oversized jumpsuit, um, we, we, we smile at her. We give her uh, affirmations as much as we can. And to see her mother also in chains and see tears rolling down her face as her baby walks through that courtroom to see her father, um, uh, just overtired and upset in her family, it 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 puts us in a place of high emotion and it makes us frustrated, but we also have to hold these administrations and, and individuals accountable for what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that we have to. And we believe that she's being used in this light because of our current governor and his so-called push for this so-called crime bill session that he pushed through that is not going to help anyone, that is just going to further and cost taxpayers more money to keep people incarcerated, but with no help, no prevention whatsoever. And we are, we are going, we are furthering our, uh, we are furthering our cause to hold them accountable. Now we have to add the office of juvenile justice to that list. And we are not afraid and we are unapologetic about it. So, so what, what, what Laramie is talking about, is a special session, a special session on crime that was convened by Governor Jeff Landry, right? Because right now, a Republican supermajority is controlling the whole entire Louisiana legislature. That means they can do whatever they want. And I'm not saying that the, that the Democratic governor was better. but But in this in what Jeff Landry has done. He has really rolled back even changes that were adopted under John Bell Edwards that reduced Louisiana, Louisiana's rate. Louisiana was, was like leading America in, in, in the prison population. So one of the things that uh, Laramie has talked about, and one of the things I've read about is that, and I want to deal with children, Louisiana will lower the age to be considered as an adult, sending all 17 years old to adult court regardless of crime. And so I think, I, I think, I think that when, I want you to hear very clearly wow. what Brother Laramie is saying. This is about the 11-year-old girl, but it's also about this governor sending a signal to white folks and others in this state that you ain't getting away with nothing. And, and like you said, the majority of, of, the, of the young people in quote-unquote juvenile detention are black. So, Brother Laramie, I just want to make sure that I'm clear so we can make sure the listeners are clear. And if you got a question or a comment, call in at 773-591-1690. I'm going to bring Sister Charlene in in, in in a minute. So essentially, brothers and sisters, listen carefully, okay? A plea agreement was reached with – I don't even know how you reach a plea agreement with an 11-year-old. But anyway, what, what, what do you, 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 you finger paint the story or something? I, I don't even know what this – I can't imagine that. Mm. But – but this, it, but this plea agreement with an 11-year-old black girl included her saying in court that she was guilty of obstruction of justice, right? Now, 
there was like a sentencing report and recommendations on what should be done with her, right? The judge in the case, who's also black, will make the final decision. But those recommendations had to be sent to the Office of Juvenile Justice, which is what Brother Larry is talking about, so that they can review them, assess them, and I guess essentially say yes, no, or perhaps change this. Now, this girl's case has been continued before. Today was supposed to be the final, the end of it, where she was sentenced, and even if the sentence was not to our liking, we would be at another level of struggle. We would know what where the next fight is, right? That didn't happen today because the office that was supposed to have done its job didn't do its job, right? So, Brother Laramie, is that essentially right, or did I get something wrong? You, you got it exactly right, my brother. You got it exactly right on what happened today, uh, the, the very details about what what is going on here in this state and they continue to they continue to try to move to to thread through a needle of this little girl's life and we we are highly upset about it because we know that she shouldn't have been there in the first place because the original charges were dropped not only was she charged with second degree murder um, on November 29th of last year, but the state, in their, in their, I won't say that word, but in what they like to do to people, uh, not in the right light, they sent in a charge on March 7th before the first trial date of accessory after the fact. So they are reaching. So what does that tell you? These may be juvenile proceedings but they are treating her as an adult because I talked to a, a brother just last week and he said the same thing happened to him. A situation uh, popped up that wasn't too sound and he was charged the same way. They end up trying to, char- they end up charging him with obstruction of justice and having credit for time served. And he's, he was an adult, but this is an 11 year old child. How can an 11 year old child obstruct justice? Even if you explain it to her, she still would know what it means because it's a very broad charge. Even some adults don't even understand what that is. And so that's why uh, we are so glad that we have so many supporters and so many people chiming in and further explaining what is going on. And you're doing a very good job of doing that as we don't want um, anyone else to to turn things around as far as what is happening and what's really going to happen and how we feel and the messaging that we've been putting across. So yes, that's exactly what has happened. And we're going to hold them accountable. We have to now add someone to the list instead of moving to the next step, which is her healing, her being at home, her being in the sound place back in a normal environment. So now we have to add someone else to petition because we are allowed to petition our government and we are not afraid to do it. And that's Mm -hmm. what we're going to do next. We're going to have a call about it tomorrow, as we always do. We always debrief and come up with a strategic plan to make sure that this doesn't continue to happen, as they've done over and over again, and as they made a plan publicly, and also in the in inside of our laws about how they feel about our children. You know, Larry, what what I want you to do, please, as you plot your strategy, if there's anything where we can support you, let us know. If there's anything we can do to help take this bigger and nationally, let us know. We'll work with you on that. Sister Charlene. Yes, sir. What what was the little girl's reaction when she she became kind of clear she wasn't going home? She wasn't leaving? Wow. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. Let me say this first. Greetings, Brother Larry. but I just want to just say I think I heard um, everything uh, that you said just recently in terms of what happened with the sentencing. But I just wanted to um, I think clarify and make sure that it's actually the Office of Juvenile Justice that is they need to give their report to the judge. That's what's missing. They're not done with their report, and when they give okay. their recommendation, 
they give the, they're going to give their recommendation, and then out of that whole plan, in terms of not just necessarily foster care, but um, it has been said that the whole uh, shaboom, if you will, schooling, the whole nine yards, in addition to what you said, is what's the hold up. They're not ready. Um, it took all wow. of three minutes. Yeah, their their report for the judge is not ready because the judge asked, you know, the defendant. I mean, I'm sorry her attorney, and he said, okay, we're ready on a recommendation, and the judge threw it back over to the Office of Juvenile Justice, and they said that they, they weren't ready. And so it was continued, as you all said, to May 8th. You know, in answer to your question, um, first of all, a beautiful little baby. I mean, just her little, she had a little two Afro puffs, you know, mm-hmm. Was in mm-hmm. oversized green. As a matter of fact, I didn't. I, I was. I was looking so intently at the entire scene. I kind of missed her because I thought it was a, a, a some adult or something because of the clothing being so big. But she had on green and white, and she kept looking back. She kept looking back, mainly over her right shoulder, and a lot of her facial expressions appeared to be. Um, I don't want to say confusion, but, you know, as if somebody says something that just doesn't make sense. It wasn't overly animated, but it was almost like a, huh, right? And um, they, her father, as brother said, Larry, you're right, he just looked so drained. He, mm. he just looked glossed over. I was in prayer the whole time for the family. Um, uh, he and their attorney sat with her. Uh, It appears to be, to have been explaining to her what was happening. Um, So that's what it was. She just kept looking back. There wasn't, I didn't see immediately. I couldn't tell, you know, if there was a, oh my God, I'm not going. uh, uh, In terms of what I was told from the first time of how it was said that she really just broke down crying. This time I didn't see that reaction, but it doesn't mean that there wasn't any that came later or what her emotions were. Um, but it took a while for her to leave the court because her mother was there and she was in her orange jumpsuit and orange jumpsuit. And when they took her out, then they were able to take the baby out. I have to tell you this. Please let me say this. It took all of three minutes for this to happen. The uh, attorney uh, for the little girl came in at about 11 minutes late. Um, Judge called your recess. And from the time they started at about 114 to 117, it was over. And as Mm -hmm. soon as the continuance was stated, you could hear the outburst in the courtroom. Outrage. This is mm. uh, first. It was like, ah, oh, the disappointment was very heavy. More so, I mean, mm. for the people. She was looking back. She kept looking back. One thing that, in my opinion, was beautiful, is when she they started protesting and chanting right in the courtroom. I'm like, okay, Louisiana, <laughs> what <laughs> I see, and so because I'm from here, I'm born and raised right down the street in Opelousa, and so this is not just. This is not what I remember, right? You put your head down, you keep it moving. But when they started, ah, oh, this is an outrage. Um, after a few seconds of, of, of pause, it was like the chance started. No justice, no peace. Whose house? Our house. Shut it down. Mm. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it was over. And I, I really thought I was in Los Angeles with a BLM rally in the L.A. Police Commission and other places because that's just how the over 40 people there from the community rose up and made it plain right then and there. And so to that point, what I was starting to say was that I was watching her and she was interested. She leaned in, her eyes brightened, she smiled, she paid attention to that. And and that gave me not that this is about me, but I was like, look at look at our people. So there are so many people, so many of our children that are being buried in the system without anyone there. But on this mm-hmm. baby, and I think many after her, it's not going down like that. So that was a long answer, brother Naba. But immediately there wasn't a 
a look of disappointment because I couldn't tell because she just kept looking back. She was, you know, it was like contact. And people were shouting her messages. We love you. Keep your head mm. up. Don't let these people break you. You good. You know, you're going to go home. It was just amazing. The love mm. that I had for her it was just amazing. Mm. So that's how she looked. That was my observation about how she looked. Yeah, so that, that spirit of resistance and, yes. and, and yes. that spirit of the outrage and the anger and That's the determination right. and That's the people right. standing up in the in, in the courtroom. Um because I, I can I can hear the outrage in Brother Laramie's voice tonight. Not that we haven't heard it before. Hmm. But I can I can hear it clearly tonight. And this yeah. is why brothers and sisters we have And we will continue to follow this case. We ain't giving it up. We're not walking away from an 11-year-old girl and her 15-year-old brother and their mom. Um, Brother Laramie, go ahead, sister. Go ahead, sister. Go ahead. If I may, please, pardon me. She Uh, nodded. Go ahead. She, She nodded as she was being walked out you know, toward the, the door before she exited. People were telling her, keep your head up. What 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 some of the sisters in the community, what some of the brothers in the community were saying to her, she was nodding affirmatively, like, okay. Mm. She was nodding. Mm. And um, I, just, I, just have to, I just have to say that her grandmother's sister just broke down in the courtroom. The, they Several of the family members live two hours away. So when they got there, the proceeding was over. Mm. And again, people were expecting that she would be going home, and it it was just it was just a, a, a big disappointment. And one of the family members was just crying profusely. I I, I just want to say, as you go, go on to Brother Laramie, I got some of the court documents today, and one thing that I. I'm looking at, and I'm having a, a legal expert analyze this and give me their thoughts for our final call report. But one of the things I'm noticing, it is a three-page narrative. And on the second page, which is, which is about maybe four or five paragraphs, very long, there's so much conversation about who said what, so much implication in this police narrative from this investigator, and down at the bottom, you know, one line, the allegation that this girl supposedly stated that her brother, allegedly stated that her brother and the deceased, whose name is Cameron Betso, were in an argument, and that is Mm. why they shot him. That's what the court paper says, not the legal document says. Now, but nothing else about why. This this mm. this investor put all of this information. I'm going to send it to you, brother Nava. All this information in here. But out of that, it's like okay. But I'm, did someone say why they were arguing? Mm. <laughs> you know, these are the mm. still so many questions that are out there, and they as this goes on. What I saw today, it gets more and more. Um, I won't say bizarre. I would just say bizarre yeah. in my in, in my view. It's bizarre. Yeah, because it, it, it seems about... like Yeah. Yeah, go ahead for the BJ. Yeah, I was saying you got two callers on that want to get in. Uh just wanna let you know that in uh, case you get a little break, but uh um we got some people that are interested in uh joining the conversation tonight. Y'all can join us. Seven seven three five nine one sixteen ninety. Go ahead, brother Nava. Let's let's go on and bring the callers in man. All right, we got Brother Rashad on real quick. On you on WVON. Good evening, well, brother. How you doing? Rashad, that's Rashad Muhammad. He he's in in uh, Baton Rouge, but he was down in New Iberia. He's joining us as a guest. So let us know yes, when sir. we got callers because we want to try to get him in. You don't want to lose yes, him. Sir. So if you call, hang up. If you call, get on and call back. Um, learn me. I, I, okay, let's take Benjamin now. Yes, I'll just be listening, and um, uh, I just want to invoke uh, power of prayer. Uh, we can vent anger, but 
a lot of situations I've been in, before you get angered, understand if there's an injustice, you want to put the master first. And so I just pray that you all get success and that the creator will open up the minds, open up all the information and 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 understand that our, your faith is strong because you're stepping. Okay? But anger creates wrath. Anger creates wrath. And that's what they want. Um, and so I just want you to, to ask you to have you had group prayer, prayer on it, an agreement that God will see because God will work when he's not even doing nothing. God will put on the on the judge mind, the lawyer's mind, on the system mind and say, you know what? Let's let this person go. Let's you know you know, I don't I don't I can't sleep at night. And so I just want to invoke the power of prayer uh of this much. All right, so Brother Benjamin, you thank you very much. Look okay. there's righteous anger. Right. Right. We're taught that when Jehovah appeared as a burning bush to Moses. It was a sign of his anger at what was done to the children of Israel. So anger properly focused is a tool to be used for justice and resurrection. You better read about the Messiah, the Christ is coming back. When you read about him coming back in Revelation at the head of a horde of angels, guess what he got in his hand? He got his oh. sword, and it's, di- and it's dripping with blood. Come on. There's parts of the Bible that say, because you have been so wicked, we will give you your own blood to drink, and you will be to drink, and you will be drunken as if you had uh, sweet wine. The That's Honorable right. Elijah Muhammad said that blood is going to be up to the horse's bridle. So mm. we need to stop yep. being so angry with one another with our children, with our wives, with our neighbors, and get angry enough to take proper anger, I mean, to take proper action. See what Laramie and them is doing? That's proper anger, properly focused, I mean, properly focused on a positive goal. But I'm not praying for none of my enemies, brother. And if you want to see, you, if, you, if you think that's bad, check out your Bible and see how David paid, uh, prayed for his enemies. He prayed that they scrounged around in the street like hungry dogs. Mm. And that was God's divine man. So I understand. And we should draw strength from prayer. And we should draw fearlessness from prayer. And we should draw love from prayer. And we should ask the God to touch the heart of the wicked. Because in the Holy Quran, at a certain point, the God says, Jehovah says to Moses, speak a gentle word to Pharaoh. Perhaps he may mind. But when Pharaoh doesn't mind, and then when the God turns around and hardens his heart, and Pharaoh comes after the children of Israel, Allah destroys him. So warning is mercy. We can't play with God today and act like, oh, it's just going to be all right. Ain't nobody going, going to pay a price. If people paid a price in the past for evil, you mean to tell me he's going to let them get off today? If he does, I don't need no God. Let me be clear on that. And I don't need no God that ain't interested in the affairs of black people. I don't need him. He don't exist to me. Just like, the, just like, just like Jehovah chose the children of Israel, we believe he chose us. And just like he delivered the children of Israel, we believe we're going to be delivered. But we got to get up and do something ourselves in his name, Mm. in his power, with his will, knowing he's with us. See, what what Laramie and the brothers and sisters are doing down there, um, they got a good unity core. I haven't heard nobody fighting over who's going to get credit. I ain't heard nobody fighting over, can I get a grant? I ain't heard nobody fighting over, well, who's going to be in front of the TV cameras? 
So they got a sincere love and cohesion. But there's anger there. As Chuck D said, I got a right to be hostile. Laramie, we got six minutes before we go to the break. I don't know if you can hang out with us. Uh, but go ahead. We'll yeah. give you five of those minutes. And then we got to uh, yeah. talk a little bit about money and stuff. Yes, sir. Um, so I'm going to respond to the brother and, and, and what he said. What you said was perfect. It was It's right on point. Uh, and you say, say, we have to bring God in it, and we have. There's an organization of clergymen down in New Iberia called A New Chapter Push. It is very seldom you hear about clergymen getting to the fight of social justice, and they have been there mm-hmm. here from the, from the beginning. We made one call, and they said, we are there. I asked them to be with another with the situation before I even fully met them and who who they were back in August for a council meeting for the Brave Cave situation in Baton Rouge and they came and said, Okay, this is the situation. Show us where this is going on and they are there. So there is a group of clergymen doing the good works, speaking on behalf of the people and also keeping us in prayer and keeping the keeping the kingdom on high. And they also know that they have to fight. They have frustrations. They have anger. They have these things inside of them that are burning that say, you know what, let's turn this pain, let's turn this frustration into movement and making sure we get progress out of this. And that's what they're here for. The Willis 337, family and friends in Louisiana of incarcerated children, the organization Voice, the Voice of the Experience, the tree shakers, uh, all streets, all people, all these people are there. We came together as a coalition, and we've been working these different areas to make sure that we hold them accountable, that we're making sure that, hey, what do we have to put out? How do we, how do we say this? You know, it, it doesn't matter. We don't, we don't look for, we don't look for it to be the person, the, the superman or the superwomen. You know, we look for this 11-year-old child to get prayed for and to understand if this was our child, we would want somebody doing the same thing for us. That's because right. we know for a fact that they are playing a cat and mouse game with this 11-year-old girl's life. And right now, they're passing her around like she's a gravy bowl. And mm-hmm. no one wants to hold accountable about who cooked mm-hmm. up this thing. Mm-hmm. Everyone else is being way quiet. The district attorney... Bo Dewey being very quiet. The sheriff, Tommy Romero, being very quiet. The judge making it seem like he he's totally innocent in these proceedings, but he is totally in control, totally in power, as we have seen this before, and, he, what, right. and what he's done to adults in other parishes and the different stories that we hear from the community, not in the newspaper, not in an article, from the community about what is going on. Mm. So we have to understand that everything here, when, when when evil plays a game, they play the same game every time. That's why mm. we know. And when we heard this, when we got the call, we said we are stepping into action right now, and we are doing it on behalf of this 11-year-old girl because we know what else could happen. Because if it wasn't for one thing that we lacked in the courtroom, as what was said, as most of these courtrooms are empty, when our people go in front of these judges and these and these uh, prosecutors support that these courtrooms are empty, and mm-hmm. like the sister said, we did chant and shout and give her informations because that is our house. Our tax dollars build that house. The courtrooms, the the parishes, the 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 parish councils their buildings, that's our house. And we should feel like justice is going to prevail. Not that like right. them glaring down at us, at the people, as if we're going to do something. Because there were a couple mm-hmm. other things that happened du- during that time that we didn't like. Mm-hmm. They had a velvet mm-hmm. rope next to the, uh, de- to the deceased family, protecting them as if we were going to do something to them. No. We're holding this. We're holding this administration accountable. We don't have nothing to do with them. We sympathize right. with them, as we have said in public already. We want justice for her son also, but we don't want them playing a game with our with our children, with her livelihood, with her sanity. Yes, sir. 
and they act like we're the worst people in the world for some reason, and we're going to petition them on that too, as that mm-hmm. room was supposed to be for us, for all of us. You know yeah. so that that was yeah. seen also. No, I mean, hold we're on. We're taking oh. note with of everything yeah. that is happening. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. hold hold on one second. Don't go nowhere. We're at the top of the hour. It's uh, yes, sir. This is straight words. Now by Richard Muhammad, B.J. Murphy, James G. Muhammad. We're speaking with Larry Lee Griffin of all Louisiana, 11-year-old girl and 15-year-old brother connected with a murder case in Louisiana. Straight words, WBON 1690. We're going to have a little break, but come back because we got more for you. You don't want to miss it. The talk of Chicago and the voice of the nation is 1690 WBON, Berwyn, Chicago. I'm Vanessa Tyler. And I'm Mike Stevens on your home for 24-7 News, the Black Information Network. Shots fired in the Big Easy. When the gun smoke cleared, a black woman dead, 11 others injured. It happened in a nightclub in the New Orleans, always hopping towards district. It was especially busy over the weekend with the French Quarter Fest, but someone ruined it all by pulling out a gun. Tourists in nearby hotels tell Fox 8 they heard the barrage of fire in the middle of the night. But we were in bed, and it, it sounded like someone was, like, banging on our door. Like, that's how loud it was. And then you just hear people screaming and alarms and sirens, and it was insane. And then people were, like, running up the street, like, saying, she's dead, she's dead. Sadly, family identified the woman found lying dead on the sidewalk as 24-year-old Jazreel Aquila Polite. A massive New Orleans police investigation continues. Waiting for the Israeli response now that Iran has sent hundreds of missiles and exploding drones to Israel. All the incoming intercepted by Israel with the help of American forces. African-American military leaders, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Charles Brown, led the national security team advising President Biden. The U.S. says it stands with Israel but will not participate in any retribution against future attacks by Israel against Iran. This is going down in history, the first time ever a former president of the United States ever stood for a criminal trial. As the jury selection begins, many potential jurors in deep blue Manhattan already dismissed, admitting they could not be impartial. Trump recycled his usual complaints. It's a scam. It's a political witch hunt. It continues and it continues forever. And we're not going to be given a fair trial. It's a very, very sad thing. He's already predicting a loss in the hush money case brought by the Manhattan, New York office of Alvin Bragg, the African-American prosecutor who is not backing down. Bragg sees it as election interference and falsifying business records, accusing Trump of right before the 2016 election, paying off an adult film star to shut her up about their affair. As Donald Trump seethes in anger over his court case, President Biden is enjoying the results of a new poll, showing Biden's approval rating is the highest since November. A poll from the Financial Times and the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business shows Biden's approval rating at 42 percent. That's a 4 percent increase from March. But the poll also found 41 percent of voters trust former President Trump over President Biden when it comes to the economy. A Nigerian woman has started a company that helps on so many levels. Afed Alapo Ruchiwe has started a tire recycling company. Tires pile up in Nigeria, useless except for the malaria spreading mosquitoes breeding in them. Business Insider reports now the tires are collected, shredded, and made into rubber bricks to be used in Nigerian driveways and on playgrounds for Nigerian children. I'm Vanessa Tyler with Mike Stevens on your home for 24-7 News, the Black Information Network. Hey, Alexa, play WVON 1690 AM. Getting WVON 1690 AM station from iHeartRadio. Try it out for yourself. America is listening to WVON. Hi, it's Tavis Smiley, inviting you to join me weeknights, 6 to 9 p.m., right here on WVON. I'll bring a national perspective to all things happening in black America. It's talk the way you like it, and it's why America is listening. It's the legendary Tavis Smiley, weeknights at 6 p.m. on the Talk of Chicago, 1690 WVON.
Tune in every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. for Speak On It with Dr. Kofi Malik. You've seen him on cable TV. Now hear his spirited conversation on the talk of Chicago. The question at hand is raising voices of the Negro. That plain and simple. Tune in every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. for Speak On It with Dr. Kofi Malik on the talk of Chicago. 1690 WVON. What up, V-O-N? It's your boy. It's Kendall Moore. I'm from the Kendall Moore Show. You already know. Join me every Friday evening from 6 until 9 p.m. on 1690 AM, that is. W-E-O-N. Cheers. Got a three. Got a two. Got a one. Yes! Touchdown, Chicago! Tune in Friday, 9 to midnight for The Fundamentals, where I, Titus T. Dell Williams, bring the mental. Thanks, Captain Obvious. And I, DJ Turbine Arturo Garza, bring the fun. Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? So if you want some wacky, some good conversation, but some fun, and a little serious, for all your sports needs, tune in to The Fundamentals. Friday nights, 9 to midnight. We'll see you there. You like that? You like that? We're in the new year with passion, vision, and commitment. Driving our weekly radio show, Straight Words, with Brother Nabi Richard Muhammad, Brother James G. Muhammad, and Brother B.J. Murphy. We're broadcasting on the historic WVON AM 1690, the talk of Chicago, one of the few black talk radio stations in America. And we plan to stay here, and we're asking for your help. Our Straight Words radio show is Black America's collective heartbeat, a space for black voices, black stories, and the black struggle for true freedom, justice, and equality. We represent honest, spirited defenses of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan with clarity, accuracy, and bold truths. Make your strongest donation to help us via Cash App. That's dollar sign straight words, dollar sign straight words on Cash App. Via Zelle, send your donations to 312-480-9775. And using PayPal, send financial support to straight words, the number four, at gmail.com. And don't forget, brothers and sisters, tune in every Tuesday night, 9 p.m. to midnight Central Time on WVON AM 1690. Or listen on the iHeartRadio app or WVON.com. Visit straightwords.com for our audio archives and visit at Straight Words Media on YouTube for our videos and special features. We're black. We're strong. And we unapologetically pro Farrakhan. What's up, Chicago? This is BJ Murphy. This is Nava Richard Muhammad. Tune in Tuesdays, 9 p.m. to 12 midnight on WVON 1690, the talk of Chicago. And we're streaming live on iHeartRadio and WVON.com. So again, that's Tuesday night, Central Time, 9 p.m. to midnight. It's Straight Words with Nava Richard Muhammad and Brother BJ Murphy. And we are black, strong, and unapologetically pro Farrakhan. Hey, Alexa. Play WVON 1690 AM. Getting WVON 1690 AM station from iHeartRadio. Try it out for yourself. America is listening to WVON. The views expressed on our programs are not necessarily those of WVON, Midway Broadcasting Corporation, or our participating sponsors. From the Xfinity Studios at WVON, we are the talk of Chicago. 1690 WVON. All right, brothers and sisters, we are back for our final hour on WVON 1690, the talk of Chicago. This is Straight Word. We come to you every Tuesday night from 9 until midnight. You can help us out, donate, keep this show going. We're almost on our one-year anniversary on WVON. We started last May, so we're very thankful for everything that y'all have done because without your dimes, nickels, quarters, dollar bills, we wouldn't be on the air. So dollar sign straight words on Cash App. Dollar sign straight words on Cash App. Make a donation tonight on Zelle, 312-480-9775. That's 312-480-9775. And on PayPal, it's straight words, the number four, at gmail.com. So give, brothers and sisters. Help us, please. Um, do whatever you can to help us uh, stay on the air because this ain't free. This is not free, uh, you know, what, what do they call that kind of broadcasting? Um, Public uh, access, access radio. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we got this a piece of play. This is play radio. That's right. Hey. Come on now. Yeah, we play with the big boys on WVON. So help us out, brothers and sisters, and uh, 
give so we can continue to bring you this content. Brother Richard Nabab Muhammad and also Brother James G. Muhammad, we can continue on this hour talking about the uh, new Iberia case with the 11-year-old girl that they're trying to put her in jail, I guess prison. So let's continue yeah. that conversation, brothers. Yeah, you know, you know, and, and look, y'all can send them fifteen hundred dollar bills and two hundred dollar bills too. Man. <laughs> That's right. And, and I mean that because we've had people that have done that. Yes, sir. We've had people that have done that, so we not, you know, brothers and sisters. Uh, I think I heard the, the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, and I, I think he was quoting something from the Bible, I believe. But it is it is that at least the principle that if you want to look where a man's heart is, mm. look where he puts his treasure, I believe it was something like that. Yes, right. And you you have given us a tremendous treasure already just by giving us the opportunity to speak to you into your ears, your heart, your minds and your soul. So you've given us a great blessing and you've given us a great opportunity. But the reality is, is in America, if we want to continue that blessing, continue that opportunity, we got to pay our own way. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, you, we, the black man must do something for self or suffer the consequences. And a lot of the people that you saw on YouTube, they ain't there. You know, they took down Brother Dr. Wesley Muhammad's YouTube page. Wow. They, wow. they, they just obliterated. So he's got another page. But what I said we should do is we should buy his books and his products. And yeah. We should assemble our own little library. Don't ever, don't ever trust this enemy. Mm-mm. They give you something that's free. It's always a hook in it. So I'm trying not to talk that much. We only got like about fifty something minutes left. Um, Sister Charlene, I want you to get ready. Because you talked about documents and what you were able to get. I want you to to think about that, get ready for that. But I want to bring in Brother uh, Rashad Muhammad, who is from Baton Rouge. He was down there. Um, and as I said, the Honorable Minister Louis Farton had Brother Stephen Minister Willie Muhammad of New Orleans to come down and to look into the situation and to report back from him. And I'm going to say this again, and I'm going to leave it alone, brothers and sisters. They hate the minister because he loves you. Mm. And he loves you enough to be uncompromising in his service and support and defense of you. And he is continually raising men and women and inspiring us so that we love ourselves and we love you too. So we stand because he gave us an example of what standing looks like. We try to reflect his heart. We try to reflect his sincerity. We try to reflect his boldness. We try to reflect his love. Brother uh, Rashad, you were down in in New Iberia. Um, I wanted to know, can you share with us any of your impressions, any of your experiences, anything that touched you in terms of being with the people, going among the people? Did you hear anything that we need to hear? Yes, sir. I swim with Lakeham family. Well, I, I like to see you on the show. Welcome to the Big Leagues. Allahu Akbar. We had a great time today, but it was under great scrutiny. It was it was an experience that I'll never forget. I got asked a lot of questions, but one question that really touched me was, how do I feel about this? And I responded that I couldn't help but to think about my little girl. My mm. nine-year-old little girl, and if mm. she was caught up in a scandal like this, because this is a scandal. I was mm. talking to the people, and, you know, like we young folks like to say, have an ear to the streets. And mm. they were telling me that this white devil, this devil, because he's straight up Satan, this brother mm. that was killed was molesting the 15-year-old mm. brother. Oh, oh. wow. Okay. Okay, we didn't know that. That's what you what? Were. Yeah, I yeah, what's going on? Fifteen year old brother, and that's what the the argument argument was about. And mm. he was getting at the, the little girl. Mm. Mm. Now I don't know mm. how the gun got in the hand, 
But that's what it was about. It's a, you know. Mm-hmm. Hold on, I, I want to say I want to say something real quick. Go I, ahead. I want to say something just Larry. I'm sorry to interrupt. I want to say something no real problem. quick about all of that. One thing that we want to do, we want to make sure that these these things that we have found on our own with our own investigations, because we have done some uh, what we call a people's investigation, also other things we find. We want to be very careful about that because we don't want it. We want the messaging to go to go left as far as what we're really fighting for. Right. These are the type of things that we had to fight against from the beginning. And because yeah. of that, of what we did, started in December, as far as now, and I know we want to find out what really happened, but as far as among us and what we're doing, uh, the messaging has to be 100% clear. Because if we do that, then they're going to start asking other questions about, well, was he doing this? We we don't know. You know that's mm-hmm. what we say. We, we don't really know. But we know they played a game. But the question that we did ask, the question that we did ask, right, the question that we did ask is that was he their baseball coach? Was he their tutor? Why were they in, why were they in the same uh, vicinity anyway? They stayed directly next door. And so with that, it continued the pressure continued on administration about this 11 year old girl getting locked up. Now, what happened outside of that, what had to come out publicly in court is the reason why the gag order was put on because of that. And that could, that could ultimately get uh, a few people in trouble. But the question is actually what was, what was really going on? From the community, we know. Okay, from the community, we know, but we can't say anything publicly like that because we don't want things to turn over. As that's going to be, that's going to overshadow her still being in chains. Um, yeah, like I said, that's very good. Uh, what you guys did today, uh, but we said we got to be very careful about that. Right. And like I said, they've already threatened the lawyers way back in December about saying anything about any type of proceedings, and that will say to every you know every trial and hearing. So let's be very careful about that. As I know, that's something that we need to know as a community, so we can tell a community on our own. We have to watch for this because we know there is uh, dysfunction between the family and not everyone was in a sound place. We we know that. We say, okay, well, now we're here. Let's fix this and let's make sure it doesn't happen again as we continue to tell our people, watch for your families, bring families back together, you know, watch for each other, listen to the children, put them in right place, in their proper places and sacrifice ourselves and adults as adults so things like this won't happen. As we know, uh, these things are at people, children are at very high risk of many different things uh, right. on this earth until they be able to come uh, independent on for themselves and be able to think for themselves, yeah. do for themselves, you know, fight for themselves. So let's be careful about that, about what we, uh, what the things that we do here, even if they're out in the community, um, as I don't want anyone to be uh, a, a reprimanded because they are listening and they are watching as they were out yeah. today. Uh, at, at the debriefing, you know, they had their their microphones and everything else to make sure that nothing else that didn't come out in open court, you know. So right. uh, we can discuss that among ourselves, but let's be careful about you know doing that publicly. I don't want anyone to go down for something that should be should be known because we had those questions at the very uh-huh. very beginning. Why were they yeah. in concert or associated with each other? Period. And then you sort of ask the question about the family dynamics, and we know they're not perfect, but we're going to repair them as we move along. And we continue to talk to the family and say, look, let's get this right this time. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and we will we will put a pin in that conversation for this conversation yes, uh, because that, that gets into a number of different things. We have to work mm-hmm. to continue to uncover the actual facts. And there's a, an organized effort to first deal with the case of the young girl. Because, of course, oh. once, you, once you have taken care of her case, then you can move on to the case of the 15-year-old brother. So we will work to bring out the truth. But in a, in a case like this, it's, it's got to be handled a certain way. Because the one is that this unusual thing about this gag order. 
And maybe Sister Charlene, you can talk about that. But this is from, I've never seen a gag order. With all the crazy stuff that Trump is doing, and his, his, his supporters got weapons. They ain't telling his supporters they can't talk about the case. They're being very careful about how they move around him because to put a gag order on any trial is a major development, right? This is from the, this is, this is from the Cornell Law School. I just want to read. A gag order is a term for when a judge prohibits the attorneys, parties, or those involved in a case, right, or witnesses in a pending lawsuit or criminal prosecution from talking about the case in public. However, check this out. A court will scrutinize any gag order, I guess except in Louisiana, under the right of free expression protected by the First Amendment, Amendment and applies a heavy presumption against it, against the gag order's constitutional validity, as with any prior restraint. Meaning you telling me that I, you, you, so you, you levying really a penalty on me before I've even spoken. So you're restraining me before I've exercised my rights. See Carol versus Princess Anne. That's the case. And Nebraska Press Association versus Stewart. The Supreme Court considered the following factors in analyzing the constitutionality of a gag order. A, the nature and extent of pretrial news coverage. Whether other measures would be likely to mitigate the effects of unrestrained, unrestrained pretrial publicity. This case ain't had that much publicity. C, how effectively a, strain, a restraining order would operate to prevent the threat and danger of an unfair trial for a defendant. Okay. Well, well, Trump don't seem, they don't seem to be worried about Trump impacting nobody. And he's threatening the judge and their families. In that case, however, the court found, the Supreme Court found, that a lower court's gag order was justified because publicity alleged shocking crimes would be widespread and would likely reach a jury impairing the defendant's right to a free trial. But I've never seen a gag order like this one. I've never, and I'm not a lawyer, I've never seen a gag order that wasn't published somewhere. I've never seen a gag order where you couldn't get a copy of it to actually read it, analyze it, and then see if you might want to challenge it. A judge is not a king. You know they operate right. like kings in the courtrooms now. Don't don't get right. it twisted now. Yep. Right. Don't right. don't get it twisted. They may not be kings, but in that courtroom, they they the closest thing to God that you're gonna get. Because even to get them overturned, you gotta go back to the people in their circle. And they got to be overturned by them people. So they're nothing to play with. Sister Charlene, so the police report, let me ask you this. From the initial, um, when the police found Cameron Bledsoe, this is the white man that was killed. Were you able to get a police report about his death? Or was that Um, one of the things you weren't able to get? What I what I have is actually it, it's a police narrative. It's dealing with it's, it's kind of sort of it's the affidavit for arrest warrant for the mother and brother. Now let me just say I'm glad you put a pin in it because I was getting ready to pick up on on what brother Rashad shared because um, at any rate you know truth is truth and how are we gonna how are you gonna get to the bottom of anything without the truth. And so at some point, I mean, it's as you said, what are we going to wait until 100 years, 80 years, 70 years, talking about let her go? Um, yeah. This system just must be held accountable. How are people going to do that? You know? And I think that's being worked on now. But remember, we're told to be careful about truth spoken out of season. Reason. And we're talking about getting to provable actual facts. 
Exactly. Right? So it, 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 it'll, it'll be all right. Don't I even worry it, about it. That's right. And to your to your question, it's what's not said in the actual legal document. Let me let me let me, let me let me let me let me let me let me back up. Hold on, because I, w- I want you to stay right there. But I want to go back. So you were not able to get a police report from the night that this man was killed, right? I I I, I don't have <laughs> that per se from the. Sheriff's office. However, in the mother's, we do have that because in the mother's, in the affidavit for arrest warrant for the mother, the deputy Paul Buswell with the Iberia Parish Sheriff's Department, this is a certification under oath regarding why they wanted to arrest her on two counts accessory after the fact to first degree murder. Yeah. So, okay. My 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 point is this. A police report is a basic report that you basically get after any crime. Yeah. Right? It ain't nothing yeah. secret. It's not supposed to be. There's a crime that a police report is given because they said they didn't know who killed the man from the beginning. They said they didn't know who the man was from the beginning. I, I just want to point out, again, when we talk about all the the, 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 the craziness in this case, a basic police report when somebody is dead ain't nothing special. But it was something special in this case because it, it seems to me nobody I've talked to has seen one. Go ahead, Sister nothing. Uh, Nor have they responded to requests for calls. Um, when I did go to get records today, nothing on the on the child could be received, of course, because um, it's sealed. Um for the fact that she's a juvenile, but um, this that I have in terms of the warrant for the mother's arrest was the most information in terms of what what was reported from official law enforcement mm. that I've mm-hmm. seen ever. You know, one thing mm-hmm. that I have to is um, just the general news, quote unquote, news reports coming out about again just. It, it's it's under the rug if I've ever seen it. <laughs> mm. Twenty seven years, brother and I writing, starting with you, trained by you, early days, I, lots and tons of court cases. I mean, right down the Nipsey Hustle. Well, I'll be pleased with Ernie with Askedome. I mean, even that case, you know, mm. with as high profile and as volatile. As mm. it was right all the way through the court, mm. information for forthcoming, and it's, you know, again, I know this is a child. However, just basic call and response in terms of media, mm. law enforcement. You know, you want things to, you know, people not to run away in terms of with reporting, which we should, you know, first of all, we're not going to do that. That's not what mm-hmm. the final call is. Mm-hmm. But I'm just talking mm-hmm. about general. The one consistent call that has been made by many in the community I'm hearing here is transparency. Mm. Whereas the transparency, I want to give a shout out to some sisters that I met today, like Brother Laramie. He mentioned them. Um, all what is it? ASAP. Um, all streets, all people, are all people, all streets. They drove three and a half hours. They came from Shreveport. Mm. You know, the men, the women, the children are standing up here, and they want answers, and they're playing the game. They're going about it the way that the system is asking them to do it. As you just heard, they're abiding by what they're being asked. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, at the end of the day, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen on Mitchell. No, no, go, go on. What, what, no, the, so were, were you able to get other documents because – I think one of one of the things that you said to me was, despite all of the narrative that the deputy gave, and I guess this is in the papers where they are justifying the arrest of the mother. Yes, this is the call for the arrest for the mother. The arrest um, affidavit. Mm-hmm. And despite everything else that was said, there still hasn't been a narrative about motive. Right? No. Why did this thing happen? And and that is the thing 
that I think when I talk to people and we have learned and other people on the show, it keeps coming back. That's one of the major questions. Well, what happened? And generally, like, like, like if they charge this little girl um, with murder, right? There should still be an argument about why. Yes, they don't need exactly. to her name. They don't. When when we had a case here in Chicago, Brother James, if, if, if you remember Ryan Harris, little mm-hmm. black girl, uh, yeah. she was killed, right? She was killed. Yeah. And Larry, I mean, this goes back to the same thing you said about dealing with these authorities, the police and prosecutors and stuff, and not being careful. This little girl was, I think, what was she like, eleven or something? Yes, sir. And, mm-hmm. and she was killed, right? Yeah. The parents took parents of a seven and eight year old boy, right? Took them to the police station, right? To try to help solve the case. And do you know they charged these either seven and eight year olds or eight and nine year olds with were killing this girl? Mm. And they gave a narrative. The narrative was they killed her because they wanted her bite. Is that right, Brother James? Yes, sir. So they gave a clear motive and said that these two boys killed this girl. Turned out to be absolutely a lie. Because they found a rag, unfortunately, down her throat. The rag had semen on it, which, of course, a seven, eight-year-old, eight- or nine-year-old cannot produce and if I'm not mistaken, Brother James, if, if you remember, was that were, were, through the through DNA testing? Were they able, I think they were able to connect that, like with a convicted sex offender, right? They, they arrested so, the guy based on that. They arrested the guy, so he was yeah. like a convicted sex offender, or they at least had his DNA in the system. <laughs> My point is, he just died. We got the him. name of the victim. Wow. We never got the name of the children, right? But we did get a narrative, and we did get the prosecution's um, story about how it happened we have, and why it happened. I, we haven't even gotten how it happened, right, from the prosecutors. <laughs> Man, she rolled up on the guy and killed him. He pulled the trigger, mm. even though the gun is, is way more than she did. So my, my point is, brothers and sisters, that there are basic things that did not happen in this case, in terms of basic um, information. And so all of that has been quashed. Discussion of it has been quashed, right? And, and I think that's probably why people are calling from transparency, because they're, they're, not, they're not able to get documents. We talked about the gag order. Nobody seems to have seen it. The judge seems to have issued it but didn't tell the defense lawyers until they showed up in court. Then he told them, oh, I issued this gag order. He was like, the defense lawyer's like, what gag order? Am I wrong, Larry? Am I saying something that's incorrect? Yes, they were very surprised, as they have. Yeah, they were very surprised, and they were like, really? Because they've only seen one in civil cases, and it was very mm-hmm. peculiar for them. So, yeah, they were very surprised themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so Sister Charlene, because um, you you dealt with this, you you documents and all of that. Were you able to get any other documents that gave any other official information? That's the other thing, brothers and sisters. See, once you start writing stuff down as a law enforcement agency, or as prosecutors, or as judge, see now there's a record that's there to be reviewed. Right. There's a record there, there, there to be reviewed. So, right, you can you you can take that any way you want. But sometimes yeah. people don't write stuff down because they don't want no clear record because mm-hmm. they don't want no. Right. Oh, so it's a short thing. Um. So no, I didn't get any, and I do want to also acknowledge this, just so you know, because I get that this is the affidavit for their mother's arrest warrant, and so mm-hmm. perhaps. All of the information didn't need to be in there about why. You know, it was about mm-hmm. what the mother did. We want to arrest yeah. her. So it's what but, she did, but, but I'm, I'm but saying. You gotta, there, but, but if she is being arrested 
as an ex- in charge, right, as an ac- accessory to a murder? Shouldn't there have been right. some description of the crime itself that she is an accessory to? A, a little bit more than what I'm looking at. You know, again, yeah. as, it, as it is stated here that a concerned parent overheard allegedly the child, the girl, the little baby girl talking to her, to his daughter mm-hmm. and, and, made, and, and made some statements. And again, this argument ensued, and that's why they shot him. Well, what, what's the argument? He ate my right. Cheetos. He took the class. I'm not trying right. to trivialize this. You kicked the right. cat. Right. You know, you took my last. Right. What even there? So um, a lot. Look, it's all going to come out, obviously, mm-hmm. in the wash mm-hmm. when it's all said and done. But at the end of the day, there's, you know, legal um, attorneys, different people are telling me it just sounds like so many of her rights are already violated. And so there's a dire mm-hmm. need to get her out, first and foremost, um, by the community. But, no, I looked at everything that I could in terms of what was on the mother's record, which is all that I could get, again, because these are children. A 15-year-old, his, his, his name, and nothing just came up on that. When I got to court, it was just like the mother, period. That's what you mm. get. And so when I did it, um, I was able to look at all of the information. A lot of documents were not there. Some of the minute mm. orders, some of the information wasn't there. The one that was most extensive was this one. I, um, I did not get exhibits attached to it because the exhibits mm. dealt with the mother's criminal background. Well, okay. You're not about to criminalize but that's, her. That's, yeah, but, but that's not unusual. I mean, generally, they, they refer to the criminal background to try to prove the person is a criminal, right? Because this exactly. is coming from the show. Exactly, and it's exhibits upon exhibits upon exhibits. So I was like, well, you know, it's not necessarily what I want. So mm-hmm. at any rate, that, no, um, called the coroner's office. N- n- no one picked up, not even a um, voicemail came on. It was still mm-hmm. business hours, but it doesn't, ne- you know, they maybe they have operating hours. That's not necessarily mm-hmm. every day. This is not Los Angeles. This is Louisiana, mm-hmm. and it may not be as busy. But I, um, um, it was, I, you know, Lafayette. But. You know, I just wish that people, especially the attorney, um, could talk. I just wish that we could get the information. But there's a lot, again, that's unsaid in this. And Mm -hmm. I I think if I didn't send it to you, uh, I'm going to send it to you because just glaring at it, just the glaring at it. I mean, I read it very in-depthly, but just glaring at everything that's said, the implications. Mm -hmm. You know, this was taken, there's clothing was found, uh, DVD, hard drive, information missing. You know, it, it alluded to cover up in terms of covering up the crime, okay? But you can put all of this, but you can't manage to say that it's, you know, again, not to go into a dependence in it, but mm-hmm. more into motive. You know, not even, not even respectful enough to say motive unknown. I haven't seen any of that, have you? No. No. Talk, talk, no. You know, read the phone. They're investigating it. Just go figure it out. Yeah. You just, you all take yeah. this information and you deal with it. I'm going to tell you this, brother and everyone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring to mind Tifa's Uncle Bobby Johnson. I'm going to be quiet after this. Tifa's Uncle Bobby Johnson, Miss Wanda Johnson, and her son, Oscar Grant III, killed 2009, January 1st, on a BART. Train, uh, train platform by a BART by a Bay Area rapid by a, by a Bay Area rapid transit police officer. Go ahead. That, that, kind of like the early advent of cell phone, you know, mm-hmm. use in terms of crimes like that. Uncle Bobby, Sister Beatrice, but at that time it was Uncle Bobby, his sister. They said, we do not want other people to feel what we're feeling, other families. And they started the Oscar Grant Foundation. And then they also subsequently co-founded Families United for Justice. And when I tell you that group has grown from a handful to a dozen to hundreds, it's about to hit thousands. Mm. It's because people do not get involved until it is their loved one, their husband, mm. their son, their mother, their sister, mm. their daughter, 
this little girl should be on everybody who is concerned about just mine. You don't, you can't know until you're made aware, but once you're made aware, there's something that can be done. Even if you can't go down there, spread the word about what the advocates and the activists are doing down there. Because again, this is kind of different from Louisiana. It's a humble people, a very kind, loving, gentle people, but also a warrior people. And I saw that in the courtroom, and I was very encouraged. But this little girl, her family, these people should not be standing up. It's pretty much like the Supreme Court hearing that person over the censorship, which we know when you're talking about Dr. Wesley being pulled off, yes. This, it, it was this, it was bound to happen, just like they pulled Minister Farrakhan off. They cannot let you go on with all of this truth. But mm. right now, there's a Supreme Court is going on, but people do not know. Like the the rights are being stripped away, as you all are saying. And so, this case, people need to stand up. And as you said, the brother, like whatever you all need to make this go national. This needs to be worldwide. Because they're taking her, they can take anybody's, and they have, and they are, and it's it's, mm. not, it's not okay. And I don't care. It's a black judge, okay? You have a black DP too. Mm. So mm. I, I'm getting the soapbox, but I'm, I'm just looking at the staring at this document, like, okay, all right, all right. Um, what is this? All right, Deputy Westwell, I would like to talk to him. I'm going to try. Mm. Very good. Brother Laramie, Sister Charlene made a, um, raised a good question. And if, if you're not ready to answer it now because you got to consult with, with, with the team, that's fine. But um, what can those of us do who are not in Louisiana? As I said, um, we will work with you to break the story out bigger. If you if, if you desire that kind of help, but are there things that we can do um, now to help you accomplish what you're trying to accomplish? Um, yes, and uh, I definitely want to thank the sister uh, Nation of Islam for coming out today. As we know, they take care of business. As I told them while they were there, so glad you're here because the more boots on the ground that we have the more truth that's going to come out and we're going to receive, and then we'll be able to give the community their help and give them their strength and their power that they need because mm. we need everybody. We can't mm. do it ourselves. We know we can't. As, as the sister said, you have people coming from Shreveport, people that drove from New Orleans. New Orleans is two and a half hours away from New Iberia. Shreveport mm. is three and a half. You know, there, there are not, there's nothing coming to our pockets for this. Right. You know, but it's all in our heart. And th- you can't put a price on this little girl's head or anyone's livelihood at all. And and, and like I said, sh- whatever, what the sister said was 100% on point. What happened? What re- what was the motive? What is going on? Who was there? Hmm. Because like she said, no one was there when this stuff happened in the beginning. And so- hmm. Brother Larry, you still there? You still there? Did we lose you? I think we lost him there, brother. Okay. Brother Larry, if, 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 if we lost you, just hang up and call back. Um, but, uh, you know, Sister Charlene, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that we have you and, and your experience and, and your expertise with, with legal documents. Because okay. to me, the... The, the absence of documentation, let alone clear and information. Yeah. The, the the absence of documentation, I, I, I think, is problematic. And yeah. um, you know, we may we may the final call may may do some things um, to may need to do some things to challenge some of this stuff because it doesn't look like the media in New Iberia has really taken that up as a challenge. I mean, generally. When a judge institutes a gag order, uh, people come out against it. The media is like, "Oh no," you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Oh no, they don't, they don't, they don't, they ain't, they ain't with that. So, um, t- 
tell you mm-hmm. you mentioned sister, Not the, the charges. Spirit of redemption. And now it's a and now it's obstruction of justice. And how can a eleven year old black girl obstruct justice? So that's what you can do. Follow our social media pages. That's what you need to update them. Like I said, any questions that anyone has, they can ask us. Yeah. You know they can ask they can ask the nation of Islam also as they have gone in detail and also uh done a people's investigation. Yeah. You we we lost you for a few minutes. We couldn't hear you. Can you repeat again what we can do to help what people around the country can do to help? Well, what people around the country can do to help is first you can pray for her, pray for mm. this eleven year old black girl's uh sanity, livelihood and keeping mm. her innocence. Mm. You can also pray for her family as they're going through it. Her mm. father, as the sister said, was drained. If if they noticed it and they're seeing him for the first time, I definitely noticed it. Yeah. I noticed his mannerism, the way he walked in, his face, his eyes, as the sister was very detailed about how she noticed about the little girl. Mm-hmm. Pray that they they keep their hands off of our children. But there's also a petition that we started in February. Petitions don't get too many signatures anymore, but it has been trickling up here and there. The petition okay. to let us know that someone is paying attention, it's on change.org. Demand for the release of an 11-year-old black girl in New Iberia. It's titled just like that. Okay. And also stay, in, stay engaged with our social media as we continue to update people. If we're going to do another in-person action, another community event, follow Evolve Louisiana on Instagram, and I, use, and I always tag the other organizations. Evolve Louisiana on Instagram, which stands for Victory Over Louisiana Violence, on Facebook and Instagram. DM us, message us, ask the questions. We will, I will get back directly to you. And also, you can also call Call my number, area code 225-800-9806, email lwgevolve at gmail.com. Yeah, and, and i, I got to say this, Larry, um, I've been so impressed, honestly, by the level of unity that these groups are showing. Yep. I've never, I've, I've never had a conversation with you, brother, where you didn't talk about basically all the other parts. Yep. Right. Every time I talk to you, you say what you got to say, but then you bring in everybody else, all the other groups, what they did, what we did together. And and I think that that's so powerful. You know, so so brothers and sisters, look, um talking to the listeners, if any of y'all want to call in, we 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 only got uh we got maybe 10 12 minutes left. So if you want to call in and, and, and ask a question or, or make a point, do it. But I, I, I think the point that Laramie and Sister Charlene made should not go over our head. Look, brothers and sisters, we cannot wait. Nava Muhammad can't wait for it to happen to his son. I lost the nephew to uh, street violence. Right, and he literally was not doing nothing. Mistaken identity, went to the gas station in Baltimore with his stepbrother, and and somebody followed him back, shot him to death. He was 13 years old, literally, literally one of the ones doing nothing. Shot him to death, 13 years old, in front of his sister, and in front of his stepbrother, and my brother lost a son, and his his mother Mm -hmm. lost a son, and my grand and my mother lost her grandmother. And even though my mother continued to function, in my mind, she was never totally the same after that. But I was already in the struggle to try to stop that from happening to any black child. So what what Sister Charlene is saying and what Brother Naomi is saying about the willingness we have to have to get involved right now. It doesn't mean, like Brother Laramie said, you don't got to be Superman, but join jo- join a team. Join a team and, and, and play your role. And, and, when, and, and when, when we do that, 
that will create the love and unity and the power that we can exercise to get more, to get more um, justice. So, Brother brother, brother Alain, you mentioned the people that have come from, from different parts of uh, uh, Louisiana. Um, how does that feel, and how has your cadre, or how are you, and how have you and your comrades managed to keep things the way they are in this beautiful collective effort? So um, one thing we have to do is build relationships with each other, other, mm. and the other thing, and how do you how do you do that? You call them personally. You let them know you your mission statement may be different, your improvements may may be different, your background, but we have one common goal, that's to save these children. Mm. We have to agree on that to save these children and that is it. We can get we can get together on other things that are different. We'll help you and you help us. That's what it's really about. It's about coalition building. Mm. As you remember, uh the brother Fred Hampton started the Rainbow Coalition in Chicago. Mm-hmm. For that reason, because he knew that he couldn't do it alone with him and his brothers. So he brought in different groups, the poor white folks, the Hispanics, to say, look, we got to do this together. We have to. We have no choice because everything is against us. And everyone has come from near and far, different phone calls that we have. We have a coalition call pretty much every week or two weeks to give everyone a chance to give their input, to do different kinds of work. Not one organization can do everything. Like the sister said, they pull documents. We've had other people yeah. pull documents and things like things of that nature. We had other people go to the Louisiana Supreme Court website. We have people talk mm. to DCFS to find out mm. other other details about how they operate as far as children, the Office of Juvenile mm. Justice, and things of that nature. Everyone has a different reach. The organization in New Iberia and about what they know about the so-called leaders who've been elected and selected and how they've been operating to connect the dots about who we are dealing with on this day and Mm. prove in fact that the judge Roger Hamilton swore in Jeff Landry and you see what he is doing. So what does that Mm. say? And looking Mm. up his background to find out what he was doing and where they're from, that is so important. And we all can't do that alone. We Mm. can't fight any of this alone. We need to fight this together. And this is so important as we continue, as they try to dismantle us and separate us and pull us in different directions and create discord and so-called media differences. No, we are all the same people. We are all one people. Mm. We have no No, no, choice. We don't believe these children are going to take on, going to take upon us what we are doing. That's right. And I don't want them to say the elders failed us. I want them to say, We're taking upon the mantle because I want to pass the torch uh, to my yeah. children, other children, to say, "Hey, look, this is how you fight," and we are not giving up. Brother, no, about, we got our, uh, yeah, go, go ahead. You, we, go ahead. Listen, we got we got brother Robert twenty two X on the line. I think he wanted to get in before we run out of time. Bro, yeah. Brother, brother get, Robert, get Robert, 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 just real quickly, oh, when you were, when I read the article about the sister, the eleven year old child in the Final Call newspaper, it reminded me of Ryan Harris and Brother Knob, but that was in nineteen ninety eight. And mm. Sister Charlene and Brother Laramie, you're doing such a tremendous job. I just wanted to ask the question when you all were in the courtroom, you said that the sister kept uh looking back. And yes, she's confused. She's only eleven. But I wanted to say this, too. When an unrighteous person brings us news, we must check deeply into it. Mm. Unless we calm the person in ignorance and be sorry for what we've done. Mm -hmm. So the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad tells us what you all are doing. We want justice, equal justice under the law. We want justice applied equally to all regardless of creed, class, or color, 
So I just wanted to make a comment and tell you all you are doing a tremendous job, and thank you so much for accepting the call. Uh, brother, brother Robert, thank you for calling. Thank you, my brother. Thank you for your support. Brother, brother Laramie, this is something that I was wondering, and I wanted to know if, if we could get this clear. Is is the same judge overseeing the, the, the girl's case, the brother's case, and the mother's case? Or, 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 or are they being heard by different judges? They're being heard by the same judge. The but they are uh, they are being represented by different lawyers as the mother has accepted um, the eleven year old's uh, defense, but the brother I believe has a public defender. That's why we haven't heard too much about him. We still have to, we, these things are still going on, you know. As we want to yes. get this done first, get her released, yes. and then we continue on with the 15-year-old brother, what they can prove, what happened, what was yeah. going on during that time, and also reducing. They're working on reducing the bond for the mother, as all lawyers should do that first. Yeah. Reducing the bond for yeah. her and possibly get her released. As you know, as the sister said, basically she said, none of this looks right. Mm. That's basically what she said. None of this looks right. Sister Charlene said, none of this looks right. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, and it's not. Mm. And they're covering up something because they know how corrupt they are. The people know how corrupt they are, mm. as they've heard in the neighborhood today, just today. Mm. Just today, just, just what they've heard. And there were different people out there on the steps today that have dealt with them inside of, inside of that courthouse that know what kind, of, what kind of hell they've rained upon the people of Iberia Parish and the surrounding parishes. Mm. So, yes, we, it's going to continue. This is not going to stop as we talk about, even all the way to voting, from holding them accountable to rallying all the way to voting and getting people registered. That's what we're doing here currently. And we have been ramping up and getting things done and making sure that people uh, exercise their right and their power. We got, we got, we, we got a few more. Uh, we got really like three minutes left. Um, real quick. Is it unusual for one judge to to see people in these three cases and and for the and the cases are all related, or is that just the way the the parish <coughs> kind of justice system is structured? That's how it's structured in this area because first there's the share, the district attorney is a tri parish district attorney district uh, Bo Dewey. Gotcha. The judge okay. also does civil and small cases in the morning and then that's why the court case doesn't start for this 11 year girl until 1 p.m. and that's why it's an open court. So they're working different areas at different times. They 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 they're doing multi they're doing multiple jobs. I should say they're doing multiple jobs in multiple areas. So that's why it looks like this. But we are holding them accountable saying this is this is what you signed up to do. You signed mm -hmm. up to work for the people and you're going to do right by the people. All right. And that's why we're holding them accountable. We're not shy about who they are. We don't. We're, we're telling them who they are, whether they're black, whether they're white, whether they're blue, whether they're green. You're going to do right by our people. So we're going to come for you. This is Laramie, and he's with Evolve Louisiana. Give him your social media one more time, Brother Laramie, and we, we're about to sign off. Man, thank you for spending a couple hours with us, and thank you for holding on. Oh, no doubt. I, I definitely appreciate the people we have met, you know, over the past five months, even even just today. I love seeing the Nation of Islam, and I keep saying that again, uh, and I've said that to them, and I, I think I've said it almost too many times. It, I don't want them to think I was creepy, but I just love the way they operate. I, I really do, and I have for a very long time, so I'm glad they're tapping in, and I'm glad, you know, we were able to reach each other, you know, in this light. But if you want to contact us at Evolve Louisiana on Instagram, Victory Over Louisiana Violence, and at Evolve Louisiana on Facebook, that's how you can reach us. You can message us anytime. That's where we are. Uh, phone number 225-800-9806. Well, Brother Laramie, thank you for, for man. We're, we're going to stay in touch with you. 
we gonna we 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 gonna have to keep working, brother. I'm sorry, you got another hat. You can right. you can send somebody else if you want to, but we'll take you until they show up. Sister Charlene, national correspondent for the Final Call, fine work as always, brother Rashad, fruit of Islam on point, doing what we do. Brother BJ, we got a minute, man. Take us out of here, please. Get us some money. That's uh-huh. right. So, brothers and sisters, please, 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 before you go to bed tonight and sign off, why don't you make a donation to Straight Words to keep our radio program on WBON? That is dollar sign Straight Words on Cash App. Dollar sign Straight Words on Cash App, 312-480-9775 on Zelle. And on PayPal, it is Straight Words, the number four at gmail.com. I want to thank our great producer in the city of Chicago on WBON, Deontay, and also yeah. our sister in our sister in Charlotte. Our sister in Charlotte, uh, we're talking about Sister Jeanette, and we thank her for that. And uh, before we sign off, somebody want to somebody wanna, um, make a comment real quick before we, we sign off. We're right at the top. But go ahead. You're on WBON 1690. Go right here, please. That's Deontay. Oh, that's Deontay. Okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. okay. So, so we got we got a call that wants information from the first segment. Um, Brother, yeah, Brother James, can yeah, can, just can you? Lakeisha Collins. Lakeisha Collins, L A K E S I A Collins, and she'll come right up. Just Google Lakeisha Collins, Senator Lakeisha Collins. I don't have her number. State Senator Lakeisha Collins. Yes. So this has been Straight right. Words AM on uh, WON AM 1690. Uh, straight Words, dollar sign, Straight Words, cash app, do that. Zell 312 do that. PayPal, uh, Straight Words for Gmail. We need your help, and we're trying to help right. you. We love you. As-salamu alaykum. Love y'all. Thank you a lot. The talk of Chicago and the voice of the nation is 1690 WVOS Bourbon, Chicago. Play WVON 1690 AM. Getting WVON 1690 AM station from iHeartRadio. Try it out for yourself. America is listening to WVON.